the Apple self-driving car. So let's see what's going to be happening. Okay, good to go. Are you good? Mm -hmm. Okay, gentlemen. Okay. So, uh, hey everybody, my name is uh, Jason. I'm Abdullah. I'm yeah. And we're going to be talking about uh, RFID applications. So, RFID applications are becoming more widespread. In the past 10 years, they could go into anything as small as an individual piece of clothing, a book, jewelry, and go into something more in-depth like a railway car, vehicle, hospital. So RFIDs are radio frequency identification tags. They're identified as barcodes, as like an update to the standard barcode. And uh, they're connected to a network system that enables product motion, products in motion to be accounted for. So how it works, RFID tag is a little tag that uh, reads data. And then uh, the tag's antenna receives an electromagnetic energy to the reader's antenna. The tag will then send radio waves back to the reader or like a server. And then the reader will pick up the radio waves, interpret the frequencies, and store the data into an external server. Um, so you said data is, but data is, is plural, so it, it should be data all. That's not the question. <laughs> uh, I just want to point out a typo because the the, the singular version of data is that that um. So data, the word itself is plural, so you should have a heavy verb that corresponds with the subject. I know that this is one of the most common grammatical things I see in my Chinese students. The data is. The other thing is a searches thing. Words that are that you don't pluralize, that they pluralize. And the third thing is gender. Mix up genders. So you guys learned something. Yes? All right, so this is just a brief uh, video talking about what I said earlier about how RFID works. Are we missing sound or? There's no sound in the video. Oh, okay. <laughs> place that tag on something that you'd want, like accounted for, and then the scanner would hold on to the information, transfer it to a server to be accessed for whenever you want, pretty much. types of RFIDs. There's a, an active RFID, which is more extensive, more expensive form. It's used, it uses a battery to broadcast radio waves to a reader, and uh, it can be read from over 100 feet. So an example, it would be used on a railway car. And then there are uh, passive RFIDs. They uh, rely on the reader to supply its power for broadcasting. They can be read from only about 20 feet away and uh, it'd be used something as small as a bottle of shampoo at a retail store. And so uh, RFID is used in accounting. Um, it's more so used by companies that rely on accountants, but uh, RFIDs uh, help reduce labor costs by streamlining inventory accounts and important documentation. Uh, they're starting to use RFID Inc. Uh, which would make it easier to keep track of contracts, documentation, etc. Uh, RFID-based systems can catch errors in data sooner and can automate data entry. Uh, it makes it easier to store and uh, keep account of uh, larger volumes of information. It uh, reduces the need for cost flow assumptions. 
and uh, it could feed information to personal personnel, which helps improve the customer relationship management process. Okay, so now we're going to move into the uh, current applications that you guys might be familiar with. We have livestock and pets, smart cards, uh, e-passports, and toll collection. So first things first, livestock. It was first adopted by farmers who wanted to monitor their livestock. And it's in two different ways. You can use active, which uh, continuously monitors their uh, position. As you can see in this picture over here, it'll tell you the tag number, the temperature outside, the movement of the animal, and if the food is good in the area. And these are most commonly seen as the ear tags on the cow. And some other things that you can actually store on the RFIDs, things like uh, food consumption and weight gain, and milk production for each cow, so you can do it by cost by cost basis for each actual individual animal. And then I'm pretty sure you guys are familiar with the RFIDs and pets, but these are the passive form, which are unactive until they're actually scanned. So how it works is that a glass RFID is implanted with a syringe, and then the information that you supply is matched with the unique RFID number. And then these uh, RFIDs can also be used with uh, other RFID enabled devices like pet doors, so your pet can just walk in and have it set up. And they also use it for exotic pets to keep regular vaccinations and their conditions during transport, and also for tracking because if they're very valuable. This just gives you an idea of what you can expect from. When the RFID is scanned, you have the owner's information, the pet's information, and any sort of medical history. And the picture on the top is an RFID just compared to a grain of rice, because they, they're really, really small. And then under it, you have, um, it's compared to a match in the different types. There's rings and little glass RFIDs. Smart cards. So these allow for touch touchless payment. and. Uh, also, they use it at your work where you just hold it up to the reader and you can enter and exit through the building. So it allows for access control. <coughs> they can also be used for public transportation where you can apply fares and use it. This one I thought was interesting, e-passport. Uh, so it's a combination of both paper and electric passport, but it also includes a bi biometric identifier. And that's, you know it's an e-passport if it has a symbol over here, yep. so that's how you can recognize it. So what it is, is it has embedded into it a antenna and a chip, and those are used for uh, to power communication between the, uh, the reader and the uh, scanner. It's being used in many different countries, and that just gives a layout of how it's formed. So for example, if somebody's gonna go travel somewhere, the first things first, they would scan it, and they would read the contact of this chip, and then it has to do the bio biometric identifier, which is like facial recognition of picture, and then it gets uploaded to the border control system where they authenticate everything else, and if everything is good, then you get to go through. And then uh, lastly, we have toll collection, which is an active RFID transponder. The transmission of antennas that allows for electric uh, collection of tolls instead of cash. Current operates within 16 states and becoming more widespread. Here we have a quick video just to the beginning of it.
Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, ja. Ja, ja, Okay, why don't we do the following? We'll ask, ask the people to come and have it at the break, mm -hmm. and you promise us to show us the video after the break, okay? And you just tell us what the video says. You can improvise a bit. Well, the video just basically explains how it works, like how the antenna receives a signal and it sends it back and uploads the data. This is a video I want to show, even though it doesn't have sound, but it should be fine. And this just shows like the applications you can have that implant modified. So as you can see, it's opening the door. So this is the insert of the device below the skin? Yeah, it's in between your thumb and your index finger. Yeah, there is a German bar that you can buy beers that way. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. You know how for easy pass? Your car communicates with the toll plaza, so that's like a one-to-one -one communication. Uh, and so, so that's so, and the system keeps track of the car and where it is. But when the transaction is made, uh, is it would it be stored on like a block, on a block, and then add it to the chain? Well, does a easy pass use blockchain? Like they store each transaction on a block? No, it's not. The easy pass is not blockchain. Absolutely not. But could it be blockchain? Would it be more secure? Our expert in blockchain is sitting over there. You can, if you put a smart contract on the blockchain, you could have RFID, you could have a retrieve RFID data. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. And and you know how blockchain, they, they send that block to a lot of, a random selected number of computers in the network. What if like a company like Amazon controls half of all the computers on the network? Couldn't Amazon technically manipulate the blocks because they control so many of the computers that the blocks sit on? Yeah, that would be, if it's like a centralized blockchain, which is kind of like a, an oxymoron, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could have like the 51% attack that you're talking about, yeah. But yeah. we'll talk about blockchain in three weeks, so let's be blockchain. Go ahead. Alright, so as you've 
see uh, everything starting to uh, communicate with each other, and it's getting uh, easier to do things. Life is getting simpler. It's, it's been called the Internet of Things. And uh, this is just one way that RFIDs can work uh, as a measure to prevent theft, because if you have active little chips, you could always track where they're going to be. And uh, they're made available to law enforcement, retail stores, pawn shops, all sorts of things. So this is just some examples that you could put them on uh, high value items like uh, baseball cards, comics, or even museum pieces. They can work in a lot of different areas. So um, recently they've been using advertising and marketing. A lot of alcohol companies have been implementing this. Uh, it's, a, it's a really big industry. There's a, here's a 30 second uh, ad for one of these companies that use a uh, they use a RFID cap to promote their product. So it has RFID technology implemented into it. As you see, once they open it, it does a whole bunch of things. That's just one way that companies are taking advantage of this technology. Right. So I don't know how many of you guys actually have seen this, but Budweiser has made a thing called a Bud Cup where it has RFID chips on the bottom of it, and if you meet someone at a get-together, like a stadium, or some kind of sports game, you could actually link your Facebook profile to it, and anytime you give someone a toast, you could have them add it as a friend. That's, I don't know if any of you guys have you know, seen that yet or not. Uh, I've never seen this, this is interesting. Well, a lot of alcohol companies are starting to implement this, so I don't know. But do you want to find everybody that you need at a bar? <laughs> I'm saying that's if you, you know, get to know somebody and yeah. have a good time, you can go ahead and well, this, this is actually make a toast. Don't demean this. This is actually a very interesting application of application integration, mm -hmm. whereby you have different things that can do different mm -hmm. things, and you, are, you say now you're figuring out how to use it. And uh, maybe you don't like the people in the bar, but you find a cute baby in the bar, you will want her, her Facebook and etc. Right? Yeah. I can see that. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes. Uh, in the case of, I guess, the alcohol companies, they're using RFIDs as a, I guess, as a promotional thing for like customer satisfaction. Is that right? Uh, I guess they're just trying to make more money. They're trying to increase their market share. Yeah. So you already use your two questions. Well, no, 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 one of them was a comment. So I got one more. So my question <laughs> is, RFID can be used for inventory costing. So would that mean, and if it's used inventory costing, could it get posted directly to the ledger and so that we as yes. accountants don't have to do inventory yes. costing? Oh, that's great. That's uh, so like, if you actually go shopping right now, and when you check out, you know, the cashier will scan every item one by one. Yeah. So now, if you just have a cart full of a whole bunch of groceries, it'll instantly check them all out at once. You don't have to scan. And so it's kind of replacing barcodes, mentor, as Jason was saying earlier. So uh, Whole Foods has been uh, developing this, this shopping cart, the, the intelligent shopping cart. It uses multiple uh, RFID sensors and readers, and it has a tablet. And you could actually update, uh, like upload your shopping list to it. And if you say, you know, you go to a grocery store, you don't know where rice is, it'll point you exactly where to it on the tablet. So you know, it makes it makes everything easier. But what if we want to like look around the store? Hey, hey, hey! Let let make a presentation.
So it, it also kind of follows you around if you don't want to push it. It's still a prototype, though. So you don't need to push the car, the car no. follows you? It does it for you. And it'll give you directions to whatever item that you're looking for. Uh, the next video is uh, Amazon Go, which is kind of like the same concept of if you just pick up an item, it will automatically charge it to your Amazon account as you leave the supermarket without having to deal with uh, any cashiers. And you don't get arrested if you walk out. <laughs> So this shows here, like if you're thinking about buying something, if you don't want it, it, w it won't register it. As long as you know, if you put it in your card, it will. <laughs> <laughs> So recently, Burberry, its flagship store in London, has retrofitted and renovated its store to have a whole technology, you know, advanced uh, experience. So now, if you buy any item of clothing off the shelf, it'll tell you how, it, you know, you go into, into a dressing room. It'll tell you how it was made, you know, the craftsmanship that went like, behind it. It's a more interactive experience. Uh, this is kind of interesting. For sports, uh, Zebra Technologies has partnered with the NFL use RFID sensors and shoulder pads. So uh, it helps track where you know players are, how fast they're going, acceleration and speed, all in real time. And uh, it's actually, there's prototype models that can measure heart rate, blood pressure, temperature, and lung capacity. So this can be used as an advantage for sports teams since you kind of know which athletes are performing opti optimally or not. Uh, there are some issues with RFIDs. There's some technical and ethical issues. So the technical issues are uh, there's no standardization. Um, there's also a reader and tag collision that can occur, and they can be easily disrupted uh, by using the electromagnetic uh, spectrum. So this can be tragic in the fields of hospitals and military uses because in uh, emergency situations, we kind of don't want things to go wrong. So that's just one of the downsides of the RFID technology right now. Uh, some ethical issues. Uh, they could be hacked, and they could be read without your knowledge. So mm -hmm. if you have any personal information, that's not good. Uh, ser uh, unique serial numbers are also linked to credit cards, and they can track where people are if you have implants. And that's it. <laughs> Questions? Yes? find any examples of like public libraries moving towards RFID use? Because I know like the Dewey Decimal System is to me like the most complex thing in the world. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that'd be a good application. I read about something about uh, but I'm not kind of I think they might be doing it like the recently the new reno renovated libraries, but the older ones I think they might be sticking to the older ones. I mean I think this is the way of the future. Everything's gonna you know a lot of things are gonna start interacting with each other. So it's just a matter of time. I hope you'll ever use your <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, the, for like the implant example, does that then just become like something that says who you are and it's up to the different pieces of like I saw like the car and the locks and stuff to like 
read that, or does it can it transmit different things to different places? I don't know if that's going to overcomplicate. Well, I think that you uh, you kind of program what information you want to be on the internet, so it won't just be going out to everything. If you want to use your car, you like have it set up, hook them up together. But besides that, if they're not connected, I don't think they would work together. How much do you think the implementation is? Like, how much do you think it costs? I mean, they obviously have a The the like the RFID payment. chips, yeah. they were three, four dollars, now they are two to half cent. Oh. Yeah. And the one technology here that they didn't discuss is uh, typically RFID started with radio frequency identification, basically a unique protocol code to it. But now those chips can transmit all kinds of other things associated with it. And so you, for example, could have computing device, adding information to that, and passing out all kind of information beside. If you use it in easy pass, it just gives your number. And what they need is your number and the time. And then when you get to the other side, gives the number again, they match. And then they know how much to charge. Okay, but now there are all kind of, uh, for example, with, uh, with cattle, uh, they could be measuring the heartbeat of the cattle. Depends on how smart the chip is. And if the chip is smart, it costs more money. How big the memory of the chip is, how is the receptors, but it's very, very powerful technology. I, I'm going to show some slides about IoT. And uh, RFID is the basic building block of IoT. Uh, so it's either telling you if you're at point B or if you're somewhere. Uh, you could have a GPS associated with it and give exact location. In general, is by distance. Correct? What does it mean? Uh, they said, I think the numbers you used was 100 feet and 20 feet. I actually think the range is bigger than 100 feet. Um, but uh, just, you know, you identified that particular reader is within that range. Yeah, the, the, the active ones can be used over 100 feet. Yeah, yeah, meaning 100 feet wouldn't do very good in easy pass, correct? 100 feet is 30 meters. Uh, I guess it's okay. It's okay. But uh, you know, this is what I found particularly interesting on the thinking is this mixing of technologies. You use this word that uh, that I never, never heard: sensor fusion. Fusion. What is that? They uh, had Amazon it in the, that video. The Amazon Go video? Yeah. Right. Uh, no, I think the one before. No, it was that one. Was it the Amazon Go? Yeah, yeah it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what is sensor vision? I actually have several questions for you because <laughs> I, I found this very interesting and I'm not limited to two questions like that. <laughs> okay? Uh, first question is you mentioned RFID Inc. Yeah. What is it? I mean, it's in the prototype stages. But, but prototype is fine, but what does it do? <laughs> it's the same application as an RFID tag, but like there's just technology. You just write it? You just write it, and then you'll be able to keep track of it as long as you have it connected to like a reader, scanner, server. Interesting. Um, now, that face recognition thing that you guys showed, okay, very interesting, correct? The question is, where is the, f uh, the face representation? Is the biometrics built into the chip and being transmitted to compare with the database? Or they take a picture at that moment and match your number, uh, the picture you took from a database of pictures? Yeah, but uh, right before you do anything, you always have to kind of install what you're going to do. So if you're going to you know, go shopping, you'd have to upload your shopping list. If you, you, know, if you want it to follow you, it'll take a picture of you. It, everything has to be programmed onto it for it to work. So if we would put two cameras, two detectors over there with face recognition, I didn't need, need to take attendance. I guess, yeah, if you programmed it, yeah, you don't have to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next one is that shopping cart application. Sorry, I, I'm not drilling you guys, I'm just cute. 
I find this interesting. You did more research than I know about it. The shopping cart application. Have they done any research that you you seen about how accurate that thing is? I would imagine that you go into a supermarket, fill up your pockets with something. I wonder <laughs> if all of them would be measured. Or you know, you read the Batman movies and you put li you bring a little lead container and you put it in your pocket and then you don't have to pay for the diamond ring that you found there. Just joking, but. <laughs> When I worked at a company that used a retail company that used RFID, and our problem was we started doing like a self checkout application, but our problem was like if a customer laid like six tags over the reader at once, it would like miss one or two. So we had to manually like scan each one still. So I don't know if it's come, I mean, that was just like a couple years ago, but that was the problem was like customers just like throw a whole pile on and it won't read it. You have to like sit through it a little. And that's a very good point because when the barcode started to be read, to be read, one of the big complaints was cash registers in supermarkets having to, to and very often have to type it in. And now, if they don't re are not recognized, you're going to self check out. You're going to take some things home for free. So I don't know how they can launch this product, uh, and that's why I was asking the elevators on this. Well, sometimes it's the signals can cause uh, disruption. So. Yeah, which actually was my next, my last question here is a reader and tag collision. What did you read about that? I, I never heard of that. I, I, I understand it happens. But. That's just when you have signals from more than one reader overlapping. So, you know, only one of them is going to be read, not the other one. So that causes some kind of collision. So, you know, what's going to happen today at 3 o'clock? Denise is coming in, and Denise is going to show you her research on uh, drones, drones for audit. And uh, next Friday, I think KPMG is coming in to see what, what she's doing in drones. Um, and have you thought about associating drones to RFID? Yes. For agriculture. Agriculture? Yeah, yeah. So, because like cattle. So what do you do? You tell the uh, avocado to say, I'm here? No, no, no. That's, or that's, you put, it's, no, it's, I, I just so it, Because it. like cattle and like farm animals, like, like these, or pigs, they, they like like go wander around, you get to keep track of them, you get to make sure that they don't want to the, the world is agriculture. I think in Portuguese the word is pecuaria, where, where there are animals. Is there a special word here for farms with animals as opposed to planting things? Um, branches. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I, I was very sorry for the poor cows. Did you see how many tags they had in their ears? Just imagine, Peter, <laughs> people put tags in your ears. Spreading. Yeah, it's a good idea with little piercing, correct? Yeah. Very attractive. The cows would get a diamond earring <laughs> with the RFID on it. Very creative. You should. That's a patentable idea. <laughs> That's very good. So, guys, is this going to change your lives? Not yet. You won't. Yeah, well, everything takes time, I agree. Uh, and, you know, uh, think about an, an idea of an application that you could do with RFIDs. RFID and GPS are very, very powerful for what we do. But it will take a long time for accounting firms to do this, or for, uh, or for, well, would the accounting firms would only use it, but for the firms to create the infrastructure needed for it. And one thing that they didn't mention that you should think about is there is a price for the tag. There is a price for the device detector and to operate. And if the item is very small, the cost benefits are not. If you're selling nails, you know, you're not going to put the RFID in each nail, correct? Okay, and if you're selling little pads or something, very cheap. Okay, so there is a place where it works. And I wonder what, how Google deals with it. Meaning, very, 
Sam, do you know that? How would you deal with very small items? Um, oh, I put mean, them in bags with yeah, one pack? Yeah, we had um, like ponytails, like little rubber, like this. Yes. Um, we still had to put a sticker around, like we had a sticker, we had 40,000 items in our inventory. So we had to sit down and sticker them all. And then after that, they did it at the factory. And then they would just send it to us, everything had a chip inside. But the problem was some items were too small to actually fit the sticker on it. And then we had to just not, we just didn't use RFID. Because I see what <laughs> well, supermarkets do, get a very small item, put, sell it in small dimensions, say five of them, and the little tag and the bag on, around it. Yeah, so we added like, for this, it would have like a big paper tag sticking off of it. That so if bag. you go to a hardware store, you can't buy one nail or one screw. You have to buy a bag of nails, a bag of screws. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Also with that, I would assume because while they're cheap to make, if you're putting a tag on something that you're only trying to sell for 50 cents, that seems like it doesn't really make yeah, the, sense I think financially. The, the price tag ratio, it's, it's an important economic consideration. Mm -hmm. And now, one more thing, now putting the criminal criminal mind to work here. Um, what can you do with this stuff? Remember, technology give it, technology take it. What can you do that is nasty with this? Everyone only had the good guy on it? Peter. Uh, <laughs> for like the, the smart credit cards, um, you could probably pretty easily set up an RFID reader that could swipe it from somebody's wallet while they walk past you. Yeah, they have been talking about that kind of thing. Uh, detecting smart cards in your pocket. So on the one hand, people aren't carrying cash anymore. So in terms of criminals, if you say someone gets mugged in the street, that's, you know, it's a, they're not gonna rob you for your cash, but they're almost incentivized to rob you because then they have this and they can get everything. This is actually more valuable than, you know, I, I know you're talking about people accepting stores, but on the street, now you rob somebody with one thing that has everything in it, and you can go into the store, maybe maybe it's worth the shot of trying to get into the phone or whatever device it is in order to make the list or whatever it is before you go into the store. Now you have access to everything the person has rather than however much money or valuables they had to on them at that one time. That's good. How do you deal with that, by the way? I'll, I'll go to you one second. I like this discussion because it's exactly the kind of things I want to do. Tom. So how would you deal with that to text against that? Well, just making it as difficult as possible to get into the device is one security measure. Yeah. You can put a pin on the chip, correct? Yes, no. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And you can have the pin resident to compare against it, or you can have a pin in some remote database that hasn't been hacked by the Russians. <laughs> yes, no, maybe. Okay. Uh, in the United States, the United States have been the slowest of the countries to introduce smart chips into cards. You all have smart chips in your cards. But do you have pins on them? Why not? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. And this is a big government efficiency. You know what, I had a friend he was a, the expert in smart cards for PwC. He's now retired guy. His address is smart card that was at PwC.com, now anymore. And he says that the ratio of crime, losses by crime, with the card with the pin compared with just a card is 1 to 34. So for every look, dollar that you lose with a card with a pin, you would lose thirty-four dollars for a card without a for a card no pin. And why did the US took so long to introduce the pins? And they are still not introducing the pins. Uh, I'm gonna be super cynical here and maybe it's the identity theft protection lobby. Why are you being cynical? Because it's people it's, who are paying. It's a, a reasonable deal. <laughs> people who are paying for 
past, the reason is clear. Uh, certain times, technology does not get introduced for the financial benefit of someone. That someone that has power and the other people that would like to introduce it don't have enough interest to spend the money to surpass it. This is, is that correct? Am I, yeah, yeah. Am I being cynical here? No. Okay, so that's one reason. Any other reasons you can think about? Um, I don't know if it's connected. Is that data being collected by the government, you're saying? I'm asking you. If it is, then there are con constitutional protections probably that might conflict and it might not be worth going down that road. Or... If you put the pin in your own card, you're actually protecting your parents, correct? So I, I think the constitutional protection go the other way. Oh, I thought you were saying, if the government was saying that I wanted to put pins connected to that door, you're doing it voluntarily instead. Oh, okay, so you're saying that's good, two good thought here. So if the government forces you to put the pin, is invading your freedom. I don't look like that. This could be, it could be. Yeah. Well, he's, he knows more law than we do, correct? Yeah. So we respect that. Um, and it's true that countries like France are much more intrusive uh, of government telling you what's good. The U.S. is very... Uh, any other consideration here on why pins haven't become much more permanent? Meaning, pin goes with RFID, correct? Card with an RFID would transmit, put, uh, require a PIN. Uh, it could also just be the, um, the cost to replace all the technology. Like I know at this point a lot of stores do have their card readers up and running for the smart cards. Uh, My Korean gas station on 46 has readers but they don't use it because they they, they have a reader, but they don't have a chip reader. Okay, so it hasn't been prevalent as big infrastructure spend, spend chip. I don't think that's a major obstacle, but I think in some poorer countries that would be. Uh, my friend, my cyber card friend says that uh, because the, they actually, the companies, the banks, profit from losses because they basically can price their products with a largest margin. And so everyone is interested on not decreasing dramatically um, cyber loss, or mm -hmm. in loss. Mm -hmm. Is that plausible talk? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit of a conspiracy theory, isn't it? Yeah. So any other bad boy ideas or bad girl ideas? Yes. <laughs> um, I feel since there's a lot of this where it's like tracking where you're going and so like in terms of like stalking or breaking into people's houses while they're not home like you can therefore know where someone is like someone can know where you are without you telling them which is kind of crazy. very good it's, that's uh, absolutely location if they can kidnap your location indicator they can do a lot of things without location Possibly car theft, um, SIP card, uh, the company that you rent the car usually use RFID to unlock and lock the cars. <coughs> so it, um, there was a lot of controversy because a lot of cars were being stolen that were just by um, copying the card or the form RFID to the people that were using it. So they were stealing cars like that. I don't know. Um, this guy here opens my Acura. I don't need to touch anything. I just get close, put my hand in it, it opens the car. Many of you have cars like this, or a few have cars like this. This is a copyable device, okay? So if I give this to, uh, let's say, the parking lot attendant, he could make a copy of this and emulate my key. It's expensive process these days, but there's no reason to be an expensive process. So good, good point. Uh, so, pros and cons, correct? Mm -hmm. or if I, is this going to stop the bank collision? Uh, is going to st stop usage of RFIDs? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I have one more question I want to ask you. How do you feel about the idea of someone inserting a chip here? Is it here what you said? In between your thumb and your head. Here. Why here? This doesn't hurt you? I guess so. There's no nerves here. For most applications. Oh. You know, place a smartphone. Yeah. But do you, do you like the idea of an object inserted under your skin? Would you do that to drink, go drinking in a bar like they do it in Germany? <laughs> it's very prestigious there. You are the guy that uh, have an account there. You're charged directly to, uh, to, your, to your credit card. You don't like that. Then. I just find I don't like the idea putting something in my skin, <laughs> just... And that's why I was so sorry for the cows, for the tag. You know, it wasn't only one tag on the poor cow, they had four <laughs> tags on the poor And I looked at it, it was the same number, four, uh, six, six, four, five, finished. Poor cow. Uh, Mochi has a tag in his ear, and came from the kennel. Okay, and so many dogs now have tags. He hasn't complained yet. <laughs> Most of my dog, if you don't know that. Yeah. Do you look like uh, uh, just a little anecdote going off the tags and the cow's ears. Uh, when I lived in Vermont, I had a coworker who ran a dairy farm, and they actually had RFID tags in the cow's ears. Uh, so when it would walk into the special stall, um, it would release food for them, and then while it was eating the food, a robot would come underneath and milk the cow automatically. Oh, really? Yeah, so that, that level of RFID technology already exists for agricultural purposes. I read an article that if a human milks the cow, the cow gives more milk for empathy. I am serious. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. My father was an agriculture, had a PhD in agricultural engineering, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I, he didn't with me, but he took me to a farm that were electrical, electrical milkers, whatever they're called. Um, thank you very much, guys. So, guys, tell me what IoT is. So that's what's kind of my basic definition. And before we go into this, I want to hear you to tell me what you can do with the Internet of Things and how it's going to uh, be useful in accounting and audit. There, I forgot my markets again, the top of my desk. Peter. Uh, so for the purposes of auditing, uh, it could be useful for the, the continuous auditing audit 4.0 that we talked about a lot, um, where the devices can track each other, communicate with each other. Um, so it will help kind of take steps away from what we would have to do as auditors. OK, what else? Guys, we did the who did the RFID presentation. What are you going to do with this? Yeah. I think the example we talked about in the past was inventory. Yes. So the inventory is the easiest one. You uh, basically identify items and you don't have to physically, physically count. And remember, I said, what happened if someone comes in with four RFID tags in their pocket and add it to it, or, or scrape out the chip and take the inventory item out? That's kind of just a normal. All technologies have this, this type of thing. Now, what was the kind of thing, meaning this is uh, the reason I pulled IoT to talk at this moment, is because it links very well with RFID. Now tell me a little bit about some potential IoT applications uh, 
And uh, I, what I want you to talk is about your house, your refrigerator, your car, your office, and your person. Did you see? I covered everything. Your house, your car, your office, your summer home, your girlfriend's house. Yes. Uh, I don't know if I can tie in all those late additions. Uh, but you can track, uh, you know, you can track the movement of you to your vehicle, um, and when it knows you're leaving your office, uh, and punch in directions to home, or you tell your self-driving vehicle that you're driving home, uh, it can then notify your kitchen somehow, uh, you know, through the internet, uh, to prepare things for you. Um, your refrigerator can maybe talk to a, an Amazon, Delivery service. Um, slow on your wife is arriving. Please. Get the automatic vacuum cleaner to clean up after the mess. You did, <laughs> right? The beer that you spilled in the floor. What your granddaughter did with your office. This is kind of device dependent because this could be a device. And this knows where you are. Okay, and you can have an app sitting here running all the time, basically identifying when you're getting close to home. Kind of to further expand upon what you were just saying, uh, Tesla has this, uh, I guess, application called Summon that's in the beta stages. And from like an app on your phone, you could summon the car to where you are, and it will like read your location on your phone. Yeah, you know this. Uh, this is not. Uh, you know, it's very easy to say this is great, but when you start thinking about it, it's a little bit more difficult when you try to implement them. I bought. Uh, <laughs> I bought uh, Echo. Thank you. So I bought uh, Alexa. I bought uh, now. Uh, Google, uh, uh, Amazon, uh, Amazon is, is uh, Echo, and uh, I just wanted to control the lights in my office, okay? But that's not good enough. I have to buy a device that responds to Alexa, and I have put the device, cost $18, and then I have to pick up an app put it in my cell phone, and make them work with each other. And then I can go to and say, Alexa, turn my office light on. And then it goes there and lift. So I find it annoying, and I lost interest, and so angry that I threw out the device. Okay, because I spent 20 bucks for, no, uh, for something that was very complicated to do. Um, I, I just bought the new, uh, the new Echo, the Echo has a screen. Okay, they have a name for it, Echo something. Okay, and it, it, have you seen it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty cool actually. And so for example, you say, play Elvis Presley. Okay, first it tries to sell you some membership. Okay, and that's actually more the okay Google than, than uh, Amazon, because Amazon Prime, had, Prime has music to it. But the next thing is, it starts playing it. And it tells you, actually, the song. And you can read it, and you could sing along if you wanted. My computer would stop if I sang along, but no, I just a bad singer. <laughs> okay, but it's pretty nice. And it always has a little thing on the bottom that's suggesting you things that Alexa can do for you. Um, I don't think any of us can imagine the kind of applications that they are going to have with Alexa reasonably soon. And the database that these guys have now of potential questions is mind-boggling. Um, but this is the connectivity of devices. 
And one thing that I thought very interested on the RFID presentation was the imagination that came with putting one app on top of that. Remember I called it piggybacking? And there was one app on top of the other, and now and then a little hardware device like an RFID, etc. But a lot of the things, like face recognition, what is the hardware there? Is a camera taking a picture of you, and the RFID device passing the information. But everything else is what? Is software. Software sitting somewhere with databases of faces and face recognition methods and, and analytics working on it. Uh, one thing that I mentioned last time, I want to bring it up again, is algorithms. We talked about algorithms. And the one thing I, I kind of went home and I said, I didn't emphasize this enough, is that you can come up with the things like uh, Sophie is doing, deep learning algorithms very difficult computing, have to repeat it a billion times, and et cetera, et cetera, and you think about it very heavy mathematics. But a very simple algorithm is repeating something a thousand times, or a million times. Exactly, very little step, move this to there, or do something like that. And the big difference is that before you could do it three times, you got bored or got tired or et cetera. Now you can do it as many times as you want. So a lot of the simple, simple, a lot of, lot of the algorithms you have now is just very simple, simple algorithm with repetition or with lookup in large long tables. And this is very, very powerful, and the cost per cycle is very low. Meaning, what does your computer do when you are sleeping? If you turn your laptop off, it doesn't do anything. But if you let, left it on, does it do anything? No. Gee, you don't have dreams with sleeping computers? No updating in the background. That's right, that's the first thing it does, is background upgrade. But any other apps that you have running constantly uh, will be running. And that's less worrisome with your laptop. Where is it more worrisome? With a smartphone. Because you don't really turn off your smartphone. How many of you turn it off at night? You charge it, leave it on. Because you might be getting that very important telephone call at 3 a.m., correct? <laughs> well, in old times, you never would think of that. But today, you, you know, you can't live without your cell phone. You go to the bathroom with your cell phone. Don't you go to the bathroom with your cell phone? Yeah, because you might get that call. Or there might be that great thing in Facebook that you just missed. Or, well, I'm not going to go more into that in my typical, but, um, but this is actually an interesting thing that we need to kind of consider all, all the uh, entire semester. So, obviously this is one of my motivation discussion. So, my smart house started it all. Dear house, when I, this is out of I think the economy, but I can't remember. When I wake up, please turn on the lights, crank up the heat, play some tunes and brew my coffee. My smart house has Nest thermostat, that, that's the one I hate. Uh, no, no, that's not the one. App controlled Philips Hue light bulbs. Uh, drop cam, streaming security cam. Sono wireless speakers. Many of you have Sono wireless speakers, no? No? Anyone here has a Sono wireless speaker? Yeah, me too. Uh, and a few other automated thing mama boxes. Yet for that, all my devices don't know how to work together. That's because of, that's, I need more devices. Okay, the start smart thing home controller application. And so you have, here it is. Okay. Motion detector, uh, control of the upper bedroom, kitchen, living room. The poor guy has a chip on him. Okay, lights on and off. Okay, and you might set up alarms of certain people that, like President Trump, issues a uh, issues a tweet 
we want to wake up for that, correct? You are so quiet here. So when you automate your home with a hub today, physical controls, whether lift, switch, or coffee pot button, suddenly it becomes a usable or screw up and automated program. You and your family will have to think in terms of programming your life. And no single hub can yet talk to all my devices. My house can now do some nifty tricks, like alerting my phone whatever the door opens. Oh, my wife has this. It's not a phone, it's, it's, a, it's something that bleeps. So every, any house in a house in Long Island, and they have many, many doors. Okay, every time walk, someone walks in, walks out, they go beep, beep. And I tried several times to sabotage that system without too much success. When I, I managed to get it to stop working, everything in the house stopped, stopped working. So that wasn't such a good idea had to reboot the whole house. Um, smarting up a home begins with installing a hub. All three are about the size of being a sandwich, does that okay? Okay, and so this is GE's coffee making refrigerator uses curry capsules and it will be available this fall. So what does that mean? Curry capsule. Coffee, correct? So this refrigerator makes coffee. So here, it has some kind of oven associated with the, with the refrigerator. Do you like this or you don't like this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> She's looking very perplexed there. You don't like it? That's you. You don't like it or you yeah. like it? You like a refrigerator that's an oven too? <laughs> Uh, okay, what kind of, so the concept of refrigerator, is this a refrigerator? It's more than a refrigerator. It's more than a refrigerator. Okay, uh, what is the advantage, I, I want you to think a little bit, what is the advantage of integrating home devices? Okay. Uh, well, sorry, they may just use one application them. Uh, if you have different brands, it's a little hard for them to communicate. Say so if you have one big brand, uh, that's why usually when you go for Hugo Balls or anything, like like balls, you usually stick to one of them. But I think it's a lot easier just to have it in one machine. So having two machines. In the so this is a response to the comment this guy was making on on the economists about things not working together. The hub, meaning this was I was unhappy with the light control being a separate device, I had to buy it separately, and at the same time I had to go into my cell phone, set it up in order to tell, to tell Alexa, turn my light in the living room up. It's a pain. But this doesn't mean that it's a bad idea. It just means that the application is not mature yet. Now, what do you expect uh, these devices to be in the future. They're all to be smart, correct? So you don't need to buy a separate device to turn on. And uh, by the way, light, there are light bulbs now that you send a signal to them, they wake up, they turn off, and etc. But they'll be smart devices, so they'll cost more. But eventually, they won't cost that much. Uh, So they are adopting the Apple standard. Okay, and who is competing for these universal standards? Apple, Google, forgot one? Amazon. Okay, I actually have a slide, set of slides, if I have time today I want to show you. Colin talked about we need new regulation. You say, I hate regulation, correct? 
I think we need a new regulation. We need very good new regulation. I'm going to show you, show you what we are talking about. The term Internet of Things doesn't actually communicate much. When we say smart connected products, people get it. Why would people connect things to the Internet? What's the point? Do I need to read this or you know what's the point? You can service things better if you communicate with these things and have feedback loops. You can be proactive, you can be efficient, you can maintain higher degrees of output. Better output with lesser input. Second thing is you can do is can operate these things better, operate them remotely for its safety, efficiency, certainly in any. He was talking about heating your house before you get there, cooling your house before you get there. That's very useful. Why is it very useful? Personal comfort one, but what is the other part? More important. Save money, that's right, energy is very expensive. You can make them better. You can have feedback loops into engineering and design process to understand how the product lies. Okay, we have a transformative end, the way things are created, operated, and serviced, and actually starting to see this. Okay, this is definitional. I think you kind of get, get a, a good feeling about this, but I actually would like to Think a little bit about sensors. What is a sensor? Mm. What is a sensor? Mm. He's tired. No. <laughs> when I ask him a question, he doesn't want to ask. Oh. He's a good. He's a good guy. He doesn't get upset when I joke about. Oh, I ran out of the quota. Huh? I, I used up my quota. Used up your quota? Oh, but I, when I ask you a question, you're not in your quota. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so well, I know what, what, what is a sensor? So a sensor is like this thing, it detects the, it's a device that communicates with the main mm. system. It's like, a it's like a communication device that interacts with the internet connection. I would define it as a communication, I would define it as a measurement device, correct? It doesn't have to really communicate. It can be just linked to it or something like that. Or can be passive. It can sit over there and just detect something. What is a, uh, let's say, a fire alarm? Okay, it can be, it can communicate, mm -hmm. of course, but that's an additional feature. The first feature is, is like electronic nose, a fire alarm. You stick sniffing until you find something that is burning. And there are a pile of sensors. What do you think, what kind of sensors your cell phone has? Accelerometers, they put your screen. Explain to them what that accelerometer is. Uh, it's about what you explain. It's a measurement of acceleration. Yeah. So if you, if you are stopping here, like this, that's detected by accelerometer, because it accelerates. Accelerometer, good name, and good example. What else? That's fancy one. Talk about simple one. Uh, if you have an iPhone, it has a thermometer in it. Okay, but we don't need to stay with the iPhone. But yes, temperature measurement is a sensor. Oh, so just a touch physically, right? Oh, it's, it's, uh, touch sensing is a sensor. Okay, what else? Can you think something very simple? Yes? Um, um, so I have a Samsung. I did you? I have a Samsung, and there's a feature where between your hand and the camera, it can be let go and it takes it. Okay, so that's a fancy one. Cool. <laughs> simple one. <laughs> Give me a simple one. Uh, metal detection. Detect metal. Okay, we're well, getting there. Okay, temperature, motion. Acceleration, electronic nodes, meaning mm -hmm. smoke. Okay, there is one you forgot. Uh, when you're taking pictures, uh, if you have automatic flash, it will detect the illumination levels. Yeah, but you are, I thought you were close. Automatic Oh, you guys are already getting very fancy. Lightning. 
the effect. Light or dark or medium. That's very important. And then you put these things together and they do incredible things for you. It's very basic type of things. Okay, I have I have big complaints about my Fitbit. Okay? My Fitbit counts how many steps I do. Okay? Sinks with my cell phone. My data belongs to Fitbit, not to me. Because when I sign in, I agree without reading what they said. <laughs> okay? Now, I'm upset with my Fitbit because my Fitbit counts my steps. But if I spend, I spend our two visitors for Indonesia and Denise, I, uh, so when I, it counts my steps, but I spend, uh, I spend three hours playing with my kids in the pool. It doesn't count my energy that I spend. So the sensors on this thing are not good enough for my, for my purposes. And some other devices you have, like the Nike one, actually detects motion better, but doesn't detect your step, steps that way. So these are the sensors type of the devices. Uh, you hold attention to a lot of sensing devices, but they are really, most of the, the fancy ones are basically a combination of these things. It's a light sensor, a motion sensor, an acceleration sensor, with software behind it to interpret its usage. My complaint about the Fitbit is it doesn't collect the things I want. Now, this is actually uh, out of Goldman Sachs. And uh, it's an article about two years ago there. Mm -hmm. um, and it talks about different types of connection things. Things that you wear, like my Fitbit, things in your home. By the way, the examples you see in, in the popular press are typically, uh, typically in this domain, connected homes. Mm -hmm. But actually, the interplay of these is the most interesting. Industrial internet, connected cities, uh, there's a lot of examples of that, and connected cars. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's not the most interesting thing about this. Uh, this, is, this is the most interesting. 2020, okay, um, first, in 96, one billion fixed internet in the 90s. Six billion mobile internet going up to 20. And here, 28 billion going up to 60. So what happened to your privacy? God. And this is actually the the economics of the thing that's very interesting. And there is one thing I need to teach you here that we're going to talk in a second about. Sensors that, uh, according to Goldman Sachs, went from 130 to 60 cents in 10 years and have been going further down. Bandwidth, down 40 times. Processing costs, even more. Um, the coverage by, of Wi-Fi with different sensors, with different locations, is much more than just communication, is allowing communication between people, is allowing devices to talk to each other. Actually, I installed my, my new Echo with a screen at home uh, at Long Island yesterday, and I was wondering how many devices I already had in my Wi-Fi at home. And then I drafted Hussein, our, uh, my colleague, Professor Issa, who is an expert in networking, uh, maybe six months ago to come over to my house, because my house is multi-level here in New York, mm -hmm. New York City, and to make Wi-Fi work for the whole house. Non-trivial de development. Here they did it reasonably well here at uh, the business school, because it's a new setting. But that basically means, uh, means my whole house internet network 
Now, how many devices can it support? Hussein has a rule, but I don't believe his rule. Okay. okay, one more thing. How do you get identified on the internet? You, I know you. <laughs> yeah. With your IP address? Okay, what is an IP address? Okay, first thing, the internet usage is in a protocol called TCP IP. TCP IP. Transfer Control Protocol Internet Protocol. Okay? And this basically deals with the fact that when you send a message over the internet, it gets packetized. So I'm sending this big message, it goes in little packets. And this packet has a packet header. I mentioned this here before. The packet header has a one address, two address. The sender and the receiver. A little bit here explaining what this thing is. And then the content. Mm -hmm. And this thing cannot be encrypted easily. This thing can be encrypted. And so I'm sending a message to Wendy and uh, I set a sentence, and it picks up the sentence, put it in binary, breaks it down in packets, and each packet has this header, and this is Wendy's address, this is my address. And that's the way information gets transferred. But these addresses are represented in thing called internet protocol, and they are numbers with four components, each one smaller than 256. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's two to the eight. So let's say a number would be 128, 16, 7, 0. And you say 256 multiplied by 256 multiplied by 256 multiplied by 256 is a very big number. Correct? We out. However, we are running out of IP addresses. So what they are starting to do is this IPv6 uh, basically adding two more of these locations here? So there'll be two more. So the future address will have two more of these. Mm -hmm. And why are we running out of addresses? Because so many. I of T devices are going to be out there, and so many of you are going to have 20 devices, if not more. Mm -hmm. Little bit more technology. This is the internet. This is you. These are the websites you visit. Use the word, I visited the website, is a misnomer. You basically ask the website to send you something back. You just requested information. Any web page that you get has many components to it, files. And each file, when it gets reloaded to your, or loaded to your computer, has packets. So if you look at your screen and things are taking a while for a picture to come up, it's because the packets are arriving and TCP is assembling it together. And so that's basically the idea of IP numbers and IP numbers with six elements, IPv6. And you know the Probably the thing that is loading most the internet these days is actually your cell phones. Because there are so many of them around and they are becoming smarter and smarter and smarter. And I'm going to teach you a few more things about the internet that will take, uh, will take a little while. And you have these slides, these slides actually talk about the frequency of devices and the prediction of how long uh, they are going to be there. And one thing that uh, I didn't think I emphasized enough is that a lot of smart, smart wearables are coming in big. Uh, 
I, I call them also uh, I, I call them also software as opposed to software. Six things to consider. Tracking. Now you have much more of an understanding where people are. Sensor driven decision analytics, you detect things and you can activate things. You are arriving in your car, you can open your garage. That's the easy example. You can make things work better. You can save money like energy. And you can leave certain things just work by itself. So let me just kind of talk about it. Just go to tracking, situational awareness, sensor-driven decision analytics, process optimization, resource consumption reduction, and complex autonomous system. If you notice, I actually, with little bit, when I was describing the, what sensors do, and et cetera, et cetera, and Internet of Things, I kind of created all these discussions. And then, of course, uh, this was a question of privacy that I had before. And then this is actually uh, the old head of the Federal Trade Commission that became worried about what IoT is going to do. And I have this set of slides that I'm not going to cover at this moment, but where we need regulation, this is an area we need regulation desperately. Now, I want to give you the bottom line of this, of this discussion, and then we're going to come back and talk about it. The bottom line is, is that the world in the last few years has changed a lot. Mm -hmm. And the old regulation doesn't work in the new world. But by creating new regulations, you have to get rid of some of the old ones, which are basically creating a lot of problems. You know, companies are full. You know, our illustrious President Trump is very upset about too much regulation in business. Is he right? Maybe. I don't think so. <laughs> is he right? Depends on the business. Okay. No one agrees or disagrees here. Very much to the contrary, correct? <laughs> is he right or is he wrong? We're not talking politics, we're talking about regulation. He's right. There's a lot of obsolete reg regulation out there. Mm -hmm. And there is still little regu that part I don't think he understands. Uh, there is not enough regulation where we, where we should get. Meaning, tell me two or three areas that you think we need more regulation. Social media, fake news. Okay, I don't know if I agree, but it's certainly something to be con considered. Social media. Any other area we need more regulation? Peter. Um, just for internet service providers in general, um, you know, like ensuring net neutrality and eliminating data throttles. ISPs, internet service provider, just an example is neutrality. If you don't know what neutrality is, neutrality. Neutrality is the question of who gets preference for communication on the internet. Okay, and what's being proposed is that companies like Amazon or whoever pay extra and they get preference on the communication. And that has been a very hot, hotly contended issue and continues being, being contended. And 
actually the way the internet works, there are things here, little things called routers, and they are basically switches. And the message goes here, and then goes back maybe for a different route. Okay, and the idea of non-neutrality is creating highways for information into Amazon or something like that. Uh, I'm sorry about a simple explanation, but it's better simple than you don't understand. Okay? Uh, any other place we need regulation? Come on, guys. Don't you think we need regulation in protecting your privacy? Or no? Airlines. Airline regulation? Yeah, but like that. Leg room? Because your legs are long? Yeah. <laughs> well, I agree with you too. I think airlines need a very different type of regulation than they have. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if the airlines here are going to put what? Come on, guys. Privacy? You don't think you need some protection on your privacy? <coughs> you know, privacy regulation was very privacy and uh, content regulation very localized. Different jurisdictions have different rules. Something that is totally legal in California, pornography, for example, certain types of pornography, are <coughs> crime in Tennessee. Okay, I'll say which one is good. And exactly what I'm saying is, this is very clear. There was a famous guy, there was a very famous website in San Francisco that was had hundreds of thousands of subscribers, so people are paying monthly money for pornography. The promoter of that of the website was condemned for two years of prison in Tennessee. Hmm. Of course, he didn't go to Tennessee to be arrested, so he stayed in California. But it happened that the postal inspector of Tennessee went into the website in California, paid his $60 a month, and then made a criminal complaint and created this law case. Strange, correct? But because the laws are jurisdictional, and the jurisdiction typically is the locality, and the concept of locality disappeared. How many of you had gambled on an internet casino, like cowboy casino? Only one hand up. I don't gamble, but I am very interested on the technology. Okay, by the way, they are very good in technological innovation. Correct? They do interesting things. Pornography and gambling, that's very good <coughs> technology. They are, because they depend on it for, for their livelihood. Now, what? You can go to Atlantic City and gamble, correct? Mm -hmm. You can go to Las Vegas and gamble. But you cannot go to Maine and gamble. <coughs> but you can go to Cowboy Casino anywhere and try to gamble. Mm -hmm. Although you might be breaking local rules, you might be being a criminal just by gambling electronics. Is there something wrong with this? Yeah. What do you think, Isabel? Yeah, it doesn't really make sense anymore. Since there's no borders on what you can access from where. Having that's very, borders actually, that's a very good comment. And that's actually what I was trying to drive. Don't take one second, Tom. What I was trying to drive is that there is anachronistic rules about loca location. Anachronistic for my Chinese students means obsolete. Mm -hmm. The anachronistic rules on linking location to, in this case, pornography, whatever. Okay? Uh, we need you to think, think differently about, in a way that's more effective. I mean, there are many things today people are, were, 10 years ago were thrown to jail, today is accepted. How, however many of those rules stay there. And unless someone has an economic or a social or religious whatever interest on changing the rule, the rule might stay there and send some 
put slop to jail for nothing. And actually, this is uh, social media regulation, ISP regulation, privacy. Any other things that we need to change the rules? How about a lot of states don't allow a car without a driver? How about some states that don't allow drones? Correct, uh -huh. that is? That's correct. Mm -hmm. And why are the driverless cars starting in places like Pittsburgh? Not in that case. In that case, they are, your, your thought is perfect. But in Pittsburgh, actually, the Uber cars are going, they are self-driving, but there is a guy sitting next to them. Them all. In Nevada, they didn't have to have someone there. Why is it in Pittsburgh? Because Carnegie Mellon University is there. Yeah. And they are doing, they are very good in that, in that work. So this is kind of the discussion of uh, of technology. Now, let's have a 10 minutes break, and, uh, and Denise will tell us about the roads. Okay, Denise, this is Denise's rehearsal, correct? Right. Or Friday. Exactly, yeah. So she's presenting this to a CPA firm that wants to make a lot of money out of this. And they're going to pay Denise a lot of money, correct, Denise? I hope so. And uh, I used to be thinking that I was in leading edge technology in the school and progressively my students, like Denise and June, are certainly doing the leading edge stuff. <laughs> and I'm, I am, if you have seen me grumpy this semester, is because she graduates and June graduates. So I'm very yeah. lonely around here, except uh, I do have Andrea here, so, but she's not <laughs> here now. <laughs> Thanks, Professor Basterelli, for inviting me to present to your class here today. In fact, I have to share with you that I was in your position about six years ago. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the 2012 class, Canva 2012 class. It was in this very class in 2011 that I became converted, very interested in becoming going to the PhD track as opposed to staying on a business MBA program. But then I went on to enroll in the PhD program, and my life has never been the same. <laughs> Uh, yes. So was your PhD for four years or six years? Four years, four and a half years actually. Okay. I started in the spring mm -hmm. and I finished this last spring. So as long as you finish all your classes and you're able to defend your dissertation, you, you learn about the PhD program as well. Yeah. Yeah. But, no. I mean, yeah. I, I mean, I personally yeah. thought the county was very, very boring. I, I mean, I'm still trying to figure out why I was in the program when I met Professor Vassarelli in, in, in this particular class and I fell in love with the whole idea of using technology in the audit and accounting. In fact, you guys are very, very lucky to be in the program where you are because right now, accounting and auditing are going through a real big seas, uh, sea of change. Uh, with all the technology going on, you heard about the Internet of Things, uh, these all collect information from you, from businesses, from devices. This is all sorts of information that now accountants can use that they didn't use before to, meet, to, to uh, make, generate audit opinions or gather information about the company, whether how it's performing. This is all new areas for accounting and auditors. Accounting and auditors are typically very conservative. So the profession has been very, very slow to adapt to these new technologies and, and, te and ideas and you know, softwares that are available. But uh, it's being forced to change probably now because a lot of the audit clients or the businesses that hire auditors are very advanced, they're becoming more advanced. So, so you can imagine going to a Google, auditing Google, for example, not knowing as much about technology. And this is the kind of situation that many auditors are in. So um, how many of you know a lot about financial accounting and auditing in general yet? Very little, okay. Okay, so for example, auditors come in and they audit or they examine the financial statements of the financial, they're generated by financial accounting that you're learning now in class, right? And these are companies that publicly trade in the stock market who have, who have public owners or shareholders. So these owners then demand to have transparency of information to know that the financial statements really represent what they're purported to represent. So that's what the auditor does. The auditor represents 
um, even though they're paid by the client, which is sort of a weird situation, but they are supposed to verify that the, the financial statements are accurate and true. And they do that by conducting procedures, collecting evidence, make sure they get enough evidence to make sure that these, these financial statements are reasonably correct, and then they generate opinion about those financial statements and also the procedures that the company has in place or then in other words, the troll controls to make sure that they, those uh, are making sure that the information is being generated correctly. So that's the scenario we're in, okay? And typically this is done, the auditor walks in and they're using Excel, they're, they're starting to use some software, but it's very ba basic right now. And they're using like ratio analysis. They walk through inventories and warehouses, they observe inventories physically in person, they open boxes in inventories, uh, they climb on rooftops to inspect conditions of buildings, or they hire a company to do that, but they have to be in charge of this the whole time, or they may actually look at other assets to inspect them. And so they're very entrenched in manual processes, and this is where uh, my research on drones started. Uh, that was me, by the way. Uh, I finally got a PhD the other day, about a month and a half ago. Happiest day of my life. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, what's interesting, my husband keeps up looking at his picture and says, you know, I think you look happier here than at your wedding. <laughs> He's very upset right now. He's very jealous of Professor Miklos. What do you have going on with him that you can smile with him this way? You know, you're the nearly as happy. <laughs> you worked four years for the PhD. I so, don't think you worked four years for your wedding. No, no, I didn't. Not that way. <laughs> Although now I'm working. It's <laughs> There is work, don't get me wrong, but anyway, it's a different kind of work. So anyway, um, this is a slide presentation that I gave in Brazil recently, in May, end of May, and it's called the Drone Innovation Auditing. It's basically uh, the idea of using drones to substitute some of these manual processes I was mentioning earlier, the inspections, the observations, uh, you know, basically the, the two big areas of auditing and accounting, which is still very manual, and actually, um, with all the technologies that have been out there that the company is looking at to replace with technology and software, this is like the last area that perhaps could be automated, which is like the idea of using drones to observe, you know, uh, auditors taking inventory or, or accounting, accounts taking inventory and also looking at asset condition. So if you think of drones as flying cameras or flying sensor readers, so that's what's talking about RFID sensors and, t and scanning. Uh, so the drone could fly to where this, this, the RFID tag is, as opposed to the object having to go by the, the scanning reader. So for example, like with EasyPass, it'd be like the EasyPass reader flying over you, reading your car, as opposed to you having to, to drive underneath the scanner. And that's the whole idea behind drones, is that they're flying cameras, they're flying sensor readers, and we should take advantage of that technology in our profession to alleviate some of the work, the laborious, mundane, repetitive tasks that we're doing right now. So uh, I'll start this presentation here. Uh, recently, the FAA has lifted some restrictions. They're allowing many people to buy drones under 50 pounds in weight to, for hobbyist reasons, for photography. Um, there was some back and forth about regulations. Recently, they, were, they had required that drones be registered if they're under 50 pounds, but they have now backtracked that. It was overturned by a federal court. So now you can buy a drone in a store you know, like a phantom drone or something, and it's not very, maybe it's $2,000, and you don't have to register or let anybody know you have it either. So it's a totally different, it's gone a different track now. And so a lot of markets and industries are using drones. Like I mentioned earlier, like they're being used a lot by photographers, real estate industry, uh, agriculture, surveillance, okay? We all know about the drones, but the fixed wing drones are the ones that, you know, that the Pentagon flies that are, you know, that drop bombs and stuff. We're not talking about those kind of drones. I'm talking about the smaller drones that have four wings, or four rotors, that it could be individually uh, monitored and piloted by you. So the question is, why hasn't this taken off in accounting and auditing? Well, first of all, people don't think about drones and accounting typically together. Um, we think of you know, more physical tasks, such as photography. And one of the reasons is because drones are really, they're, they're basically just camera, they're objects, and so they don't have ability to exercise professional skepticism, which is the quality one as an auditor, which is you know, questioning mind, okay? So as an auditor, you never want to take things for face value, you always are questioning. Uh, you don't want to assume that the client is in the same financial condition from year after year. You want to re-examine evidence every year. 
So you have the question in mind, you inquire about things, um, and this is one question, so the, the drone can take place in the auditor account all the way, but they can certainly take care of some of the more mundane or routine tasks. So, for example, I want, but the good idea of what the drone could do, here is an example of perfect where the cars are being loaded into this warehouse, our poor warehouse, and they're being read by the drone. So here comes our drone, it's going to save odds from walking around past all the cars and then read all the scans, all the RFID tags. Robots, you know, for some manual tasks, particularly ones that are ground based, um, and also software bots, which are taking place in many functions already in the financial side, the finance industry. Um, they're projecting probably in a couple of years that 30% of finance jobs will go away by the way of automation. You may have seen ads in, in uh, the TV for an, uh, a tax, uh, um, IBM Watson taking over the tax function at uh, HR Block. So you could walk into an HR block, HR block office and have and have the choice. I mean, actually, your software or your tax is being uh, finished and completed by IBM Watson if you walk into their, one of their shops. So um, for, some, from, for some industries, uh, we do have automation taking place. It's actually removing like the, the person doing the real routine task and actually being held on that tax tax accountant or the auditor to do more complex returns. So we're not trying to replace the accountant or the auditor, we're trying to actually 
augment your work so that you can do more sophisticated analysis, more demanding analysis, uh, and look at more complex situations. So um, looking at the process of how a firm would go about doing this, we have some processes we have to identify, first of all, yeah, uh, that there's a problem. Okay, the problem is that accountant auditors go into clients now who are increasingly more automated, who use more technology, have you know very complex ERP systems. Um, who's comp I mean, particularly in this area, we have financial financial firms and manufacturers who are doing lots of automation in their processes. Okay, so auditors are walking in and they need to know about these functions and processes, and they need to be more sophisticated about how they do uh, go about their examination because the clients expect it. So we have a problem for the auditing and accounting profession. That is, how do we get from where we're at now to it being more automated, more technically sophisticated? Then we have to define how we go about you know, the objective of the solution. And we have to design an artifact or a sandbox environment that we can try to, to, to test out these functions, that we demonstrate the solution, uh, then we have to evaluate whether this actually addresses a problem for the firm, for the, the accounting profession. It could be that maybe it's too much money or maybe it's uh, too hard to train accountants and auditors to learn how to fly drones. I mean, I know I'm still trying to learn, and I keep on crashing all the time. And so I buy very cheap ones, little tiny $50 hobby drones, and I'm, I'm not a video game player either, so maybe it's my own skill set. But maybe, like you guys, probably have more fun, probably easier for you to fly a drone than it would be for me. So then we also would talk about how are we gonna educate the industry to use this more in the in the audit field, the accounting field. So I know the big four are starting to look now at using, you know, using drones. Uh, PwC uh, in Poland actually has a whole drones division that they advise their clients. Uh, many businesses in drone, uh, use drones in Poland for many different uh, functions. Like they use it to transport medicines without, you know, to distant locations. They use it for monitoring traffic. They use it for um, all kinds of sorts of tasks. So um, depending on the country, uh, there's very, uh, very sophisticated development of use of drones usage. So we do have some problems. We have to look at the current auditing and accounting standards, which uh, are very, very, very definite, particularly with inventory, that the auditor has to be physically involved with the, with the inventory. You have to observe it. You have to verify it by opening boxes, verifying you know, the contents of boxes, for example, verifying accounts, looking at the processes that the, the client has in place to take these inventories. All these are parts of the, of the evaluation process, plus uh, asset evaluation. So you're looking to see whether the condition of the asset matches the financial valuation the firm has provided to you. So then that means climbing rooftops or you know, examining uh, you know, oil, you know, all those oil drums, the facilities there by the turnpike to make sure that those big oil tankers are actually full of oil and not water. So you have measurements to take. Oh, oil. Okay. Well, or vodka, right? Well, the, <laughs> I would love to have that audit job, right? <laughs> well, my wife, so, my wife was, uh, with, uh, before she joined Cooper's and Leiden, she was a smaller firm in LA, and she was auditing um, uh, meal uh, uh, meat retailer, and had to go into the, into the big freezers. Yeah, that's very cold. And, and count cows, uh, whatever they were hanging there. <laughs> and she's a nice little girl from Hong Kong. Maybe 95 okay. pounds. And she couldn't <laughs> recognize what was a cow, what was a bull, definitely not. Yeah, well. Or, or what was a lamb, and etc. etc. And you know, like, very cold in there. So. I don't, I don't know whether drones have function was that cold. I don't know. I have to check that out. I'm curious now, come to think of it, where they could go to a freezer and do an inventory. I'm sure they have drones. Yeah, yeah. Because they have underwater drones too now. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is a process that we want to go through. We have to look at all the auto standards, FAA regulations, which are, they're that's like an evolving animal right now. But for example, they had put it, like I said, mentioned earlier, if you bought a drone that's less than 50 pounds, like one of the, the four motor drones, you have to register with the FAA, which is not a big process, but still, they, they could control, they had access to see where the drone was, they could, they could monitor your activity, and the upper court basically turned that down, so now you don't have to register the drone. So um, they're still trying to find out how to do this because there are security issues. I don't know if you heard recently, Andrea sent me the, uh, the Twitter about it, but there was a gentleman who escaped from one of the, the jails in North Carolina, 
And one reason I was scared because somebody flew a drone in with the with the tools and gave it to him. Like the drone flew in past the guards with July Fourth night or whatever, and the the drone delivered the tools and the guy broke out of jail. And so if that can happen with tools, then what can happen with other items? So my next, I mean, you talk security guys, they're experts about it, they'll tell you that they're worried that the drone could fly into a stadium with like a small amount of chemicals or some kind of little bomb and it's go off and no one would be able to stop it. So uh, I think they will have to flesh out the regulations on this, but what we're more concerned about how it affects us in terms of you know, our audit and accounting applications. And then you know, looking at the drone architecture, what would the drone have to look like, the software that has to match the, what the drone activities are, um, making sure the information is secure, and then also the other technologies that would go with the drone. For example, you know, could we work a robot and drone together in a warehouse? Could we have an automated software running? So there's always different levels of automation that could go into play between the three aspects. And the biggest one so far, which affects in some, in some audits, would be the height regulation. So right now all drones can fly over 500 feet in the sky unless you have a special permit. So if you're trying to uh, look at the value of a certain size skyscraper in Manhattan, you might have a problem because they're higher than 500 feet. So there are, there are uh, authorizations that have to be met. And these are some of the rules real quickly here. Uh, the big thing is, you know, any drone used for business does have to be registered. So a hobbyist drone is not being registered, but a, a business drone, like a drone used by a counter or auditor, would have to be uh, registered. You can't fly with people or cars, for example, if you're out in public. Um, you have to fly within the range that's allowed by FAA, and every town is getting more and more regulations about drone usage. Uh, police force will use drones wherever they want to, pretty much, but um, there are some limitations. You have to know the town rules you have. Um, and there's a website here that's constantly being updated, so you know, in terms of work and business here, you can see we have to register. Now, if you want to get a, a drone pilot license, that'd probably be the best uh, solution, or maybe one auditor on the team could have um, pilot uh, license uh, certification. So that could, you know, maybe KPMG or one of the big four could have you know, a special division that had you know, certified drone pilots who could actually you know, be part of, the, of, of various different uh, audits, for example. Just like we used also for the, the specialist in other, in other areas. So example, the software, uh, if they, once drones are registered, we can see where they're located. So you hear the blue ones are, are the okay locations, the red ones are where we have issues with the height, maybe they're going higher than 500 feet, or they're flying in an area that's restricted and they're still violating that area. And this is the software that's bought up by Verizon actually called Skyward. Um, some Verizon, Verizon shops will have drones you can buy. And it links in like not only where you're flying, but also the areas that are safe and okay. So most airports have very big restrictions about where you can fly the drone. And the red circle there is where President Trump lives, or where he used to live, yeah. right? So that's, that's like totally mind. off limits, okay? Mm -hmm. So any that's drone goes near that place is actually not allowed. So Professor Nicholas cannot fly a drone by his house. But you could go to Long Island and, and float it out here. You can see this, you know, this area is yellow by the airports, but you live out past the airport, right? I bought a drone for my one and a half year old grandson. James. James. Well, well your, your son-in-law, uh, Oh, he yeah. uses it. Right? Yeah, he uses it all the time, right? But I wanted to play with the drone, so I bought it for my parents. Yeah. <laughs> but he's, is he flying it yet? Okay. Is he flying it? We are working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that. <laughs> so we're expecting, like, we're expecting because drones are very, you know, they're very efficient, they're, they can fly around and access places that human beings couldn't access for easily. We're expecting to see some efficiency at scale, so Already companies internally have discovered that you know, one drone can catch as much stock in a warehouse in two days. There's an odd team of 80 people with handheld scanners and if workless can count in three days. So how many of you have done a warehouse inventory before? It's, it's not, it's, it can be a very laborious process. I mean, you have like pallets that are three layers deep. You know, you have like high, uh, big, these big high shelves and you have to pull everything out and count pallets and you know, it's a big nightmare for companies because they have to stop the activity in that area of the warehouse and shut down their business because they have to count it. You know, the auditors require that you don't bring in, you know, you can't have things being big shipped out or objects coming in. So there's a lot to be controlled. And also we expect to see cost saving the bridges, for example. Uh, here in New Jersey, they started testing already using the Delaware State Bridge. 
Um, they can, they've been saving money uh, with some of the audits by inspecting below the roof, I mean below the road and not above, but they help them with the audit of that bridge. And also provide real-time collection of data, so uh, we can immediately observe um, any kind of issues going on, and, and perhaps the audit client can provide data that was provided by the drone periodically during the year to help with augment the audit. So that's an example, a typical root of bridge situation here. It's hard to see right here, this is the newest bridge over there, by uh, Hoover Dam. Mm -hmm. um, has anybody been to Hoover Dam recently? Oh, no. bridge, oh, well that bridge was it being constructed when you were there? Yeah. You saw how high that was, right? Yeah. But now it's like they decided that drones are going to inspect that bridge for going forward in terms of condition because it's so high, mm -hmm. it's over 900 feet in the sky, I believe, mm -hmm. and nobody really wants to be climbing up around that because there's no place really to hang in the spans, but the down here is a problem, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't want to be the guy repelling. Maybe Jimmy would, but I wouldn't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. So this is like another. Jimmy would do it. Yeah, this is the Delaware Bridge. So you see these long spans here that have to be tested. Uh, this is a very small part of the drone of the inspection process, but it takes months to inspect the bridge. This is the top of the span, so I wouldn't want to have that job. We have to inspect all these different components. The drone can fly around and get very good pictures of this. And there's the top of the bridge, and this is a different kind of view that you don't normally have. So. The drone can provide a different view, a different viewpoint than typically provided by a human being. And again, this is a, that same bridge again uh, in Las Vegas mm -hmm. or by the Hoover Dam. Um, you can see how high it is. And but fortunately, they drive over it, so you, don't, you can't see over the sides of the bridge. <laughs> so now we're talking about the audit standards. See what it, so now we have this idea of what we could do with, with the drone and other automation technology in the audit and accounting sphere, but the question is like, does it really fit into what the standards provide? So um, I know you guys don't know a lot about auditing, but I just wanted to tell you that there's a lot of regulations about the processes that we do as auditors to collect information. So uh, um, there's inspection of records or documents, so that could be, depending on what kind of documents there are, but it could be the manual inspection or it could be electronic documents. The inspection of tangible assets, so we're doing inventories, walkthroughs, watching inventory being taken, and that's required by the standards. So the standards require that the auditor does a physical observation and a physical verification of, of inventories. Of it's all observation, so we have to observe uh, the processes uh, that the client goes through. So seeing how the workers interact with their computers, like what do they do they leave their computers on when they walk away? Do they do other processes? I mean, how, how do they hold the warehouse? during the inspection. All these are different types of processes you're observing and you're either making a comment on or you're noting as, as part of the audit inspection. Then you also have inquiry, which is a written oral interview. So um, we don't see that there could be much application for automation there, but may, perhaps there could be. But we don't see drones being like the ones that could, would interview with the client or management. Uh, confirmation, so we're verifying compounds. Typically that would be sending out you know, confirmation, sending an account balance to the customer saying, would you agree with this balance? And then getting a notification back. Something different than what you normally would do with a drone. Recalculation, you know, basically reperforming what the, the client has generated as, as, you know, for their numbers or financial statements. So making sure that you agree with that calculation. Reperformance. So we reperform procedures to verify. So this is where a drone might be interesting because um, it could reperform parts of the inventory, for example or it could open up boxes if we had get a robotic drone. And then analytical procedures, uh, for typically this has been scanning and statistics. Now scanning is very interesting, that's basically like sort of eyeballing or like reviewing or exploring data or information to see what's there. So that's a uh, sort of a research project with another professor here, uh, Shanta, right? And we're talking about how scanning could be considered to be really more with, with software, we can do a lot more than just like eyeballing. We can actually do very uh, open-ended exploratory analysis. So, you know, using visualization, clustering, and trying to see the similarities of the transactions. So, uh, these are the types of processes we go through as auditors um, to some varying degree, depending on the client, to gather the data, okay? So, um, that's why we're trying to reduce the workload of some of these processes here to make them more automated and less mundane. Uh, particularly ones where there might be more human error involved. But right now, this is still our auditor or our accountant. They have to walk through this warehouse and manually or physically verify inventory. Mm -hmm. So 
So looking at that, then taking what you learned today, or you learned in another class that Professor Miklos has had here, uh, we can imagine that even RFID tagging might help a little bit, right? So even if you have tags on items, you still have to verify it. You still are walking around, and you're still trying to read the scan the data to make sure that, it, that it's there, that that tag represents what it purports to represent, or that everything's been tagged. So those are two. These are experts in RFID tagging. Right. Had a presentation. Oh, really? Okay. Particularly those guys that are in the bank. Oh, okay. So, you know, the, the, the big debate is whether they really represent what they, they say to it they're representing, right? The correct thing is scanning. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I know people that have, you know, uh, trucks and then they drive through the easy pass with a car pass, right? And the, and, the, and the toll is different. You know, unless the easy pass catches it or they take a picture and then something matches that picture with the actual scan, that person gets away with it, right? So that's just one area. So the question is like whether that represents what it was tagging. And secondly, whether everything was tagged. So uh, those are two areas where the scanning, it still has an open question mark. We still need some, some eyeballing, some verification, which is why still with the audit, with RFID scans, so the auditor is now walking around with a scanner reader as opposed to a notebook. It's still the same job. They have to walk around, they have to verify. So uh, therefore, we also have, if we look at the same process again with drones, we can see the drone could do a lot of these observation activities, evaluations, inspection, of, depending on the ver uh, level of automation. So a pilot to drone would be one where I'm actually with my cell phone or other instrument and I'm actually sort of using uh, controls, I'm, I'm, pro I'm controlling the drone. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling the drone where to go. And then the automated one would be where, let's say you have, the, you're always doing the same routine inventories, you constantly go back and forth, and the drone would actually just automatically be programmed to do these um, inspections automatically. And so you have an idea of what we're talking about. Here is a inspection process. Now this is the issue with RFID uh, inventory still. <laughs> you still have to climb up there and read all the scans and, and scan all the tags. This looks like a lot, looks like a lot more fun, right? This is the view of it inside the drone. This is the drone seat. I'd rather do that than take inventory. Inventory is real royal pain in the you know what. I mean, I remember like when I was doing internal auditing years ago, I mean, every Friday we'd have to close down the warehouse and take uh, routine inventories. And then once a month it was really a nightmare. And you're trying to close, you know, reduce the truckloads coming in and you'd have to like, it's, it's a totally different scenario and you get tired of it after a while. So, I mean, I wish I had known about drones back then. So we also have observation, for example, where we, um, I don't know, I, I, I feel a little leery, and I think a lot of people would too, about having like, the idea of a drone watching what you're doing. But you think about it, if it's a flying camera, I mean, many companies have cameras installed you know, in different locations in the buildings, or even outside of the parking lots or outdoors, and the employees are aware that they're there, is that you, know, just, you don't pay attention anymore. But it's something about flying, something hovering around you that might be a little disconcerting, right? So, Maybe the drone could watch you know, processes or activities, but the drone could certainly uh, inspect assets probably. They could visually inspect, and then you know, based on the video feeds, you could make analysis of the, of, the, of the value of the product. So for example, here is the building industry is using drones a lot already for construction analysis. So uh, <coughs> monitoring construction progress and activity. This is what the drone would normally just see routine flying around this building here. A lot of the potential of drone lies within the underlying software, the back-end software. So this, is, for example, is a nest read uh, software visualization, which actually can read into the building and see the different structures and the different uh, the weight bearing of uh, beams are, things like that. And this is like another type of model they use, a wireframe model. So this is all the drone picking up the, the, the feed 
Heated at the base was the vent oven and softener. And then we have another one. This is like a bridge inspection here. This is a very old bridge in Magdeburg, Germany, which is now being uh, set for renovation. And they want to get really close up because it's, it's, it's a rebuilding of a very old antique type of bridge and they want to rebuild it very close to the original condition. So it requires a very detailed inspection. Software to pull out, but what has to be done with that area? What are the what, what are they gonna have to mold like on the other side for the end to rebuild this recarve the stone? It'd be very hard for a person to take pictures like this. Very close up to it. The bridge, uh, recent data on all this above the bridge. And it was nice, nice that this could be done in an hour to as opposed to several days. And the bridge can be closed down for traffic, so the ground is actually has a great potential to alleviate a lot of the burdens of bridge inspections. And you know, in the United States, like all these states, require to inspect the bridges so based on the schedule. So older bridges can be inspected every year, newer bridges can be inspected once every five years. But it's, it's, Part of the government auditor's task, which is not very pleasant. I mean, you can see it can be quite an um, you know, undertaking. So now we're talking about auto automation. Um, basically, there's a certain process that all the companies went through that we, we've identified in our research, and we have to identify objectives, like what, what, what are the problems that can address, what's the value that can provide, develop the process, uh, implement the process, what kind of changes in the process will be required, and then also monitor and make sure that they actually provide value. So, uh, as you know, uh, we have audit procedures, which I went over earlier today, about the different procedures involved with an audit, which you would be doing as an auditor or even as an accountant. And some of these can be automated, so we're assuming that the drones and some of these other processes can be automated. And then furthermore, in that, in that uh, sphere, even more of those could be part of continuous auditing, which is, real-time feeding of data and information and real-time uh, examination of the alerts and, uh, and feedback to see whether transactions are abnormal or not. So, uh, Professor Miklos, I think you've taught them about continuous auditing already? No, no. Oh, okay. So the idea is that we have all these transactions that occur, you know, like, you know, like let's, take the, let's take the easy pass, for example. You have all these cars coming in continuously, and every time the, mod, you know, the easy pass is read, reads a scan of the car, it feeds that information to a software system which has monitors to see whether um, you know, people are in violation of their, of their tolls or whatever, or make sure, or they may match with the video feeds also to make sure that the car matches the, the scan tag or the vehicle matches what the tag saying it was. So um, basically they're monitoring, they're, they're, they're capturing all this information and then they have alerts. So if a car goes through and then it owes $100, still drives through, then it's going to be flagged, or if it's, or if, for example, if it doesn't have the money to cover the toll, then it'll be flagged, and then we would be sent a notice, or it would be a fine, um, or if, you know, maybe somebody might be arrested, or something, you know, depending on the nature of the violation. So the idea is that you have data that's going right away to a, a, soft, a system which is analyzing the information right away on a real-time basis. Or another um, good example is credit cards. Um, how many of you have like been at a place and try to, uh, to order some of the credit card, like a store, and have them call you or say, well, we can't accept this transaction? I mean, I've been there a few, a few times where there's an issue where because it's a different kind of place to go to or different amount or different kind of merchant, that they'll flag the transaction right away and they'll put it on audit alert and they'll, they'll tell them that you can verify that's you, they're not gonna approve the transaction. That's a good example also of continuous auditing. Uh, did, can you think of any other examples? I mean, you want to figure out if uh, all your telephone calls are being billed. Right. So you take measurements out of the telephone switches. Yeah. And at the same time, you match it to the appropriate timing to the billing. Okay. 
is a continu it's a meta control, it's a control of the controls. Exactly. In values. Uh, a lot of people are doing yeah. different types. Uh, at Itaú Bank, we were uh, looking at uh, every day, uh, looking at transactions on each one of the 1400 branches to see transactions that exceeded allowable credit limits. Uh, see the transactions that look strange for some reason or the other. We have 18 indexes that we are using uh, to verify. If anything that went wrong, you would uh, immediately uh, send a, a warning to the, to the manager in charge or the superior of the manager. In fact, I mean, you guys have a very unique opportunity. Your, your professor here, Ms. Miklos, um, he started continuous auditing. So it, he, he started the whole idea with a visionary many years ago in the early 90s, right? In AT&T Bell Labs. 86. 86, okay, but the 86. paper you published in the early 90s. Um, I, in fact, I embarrass all the time whenever I have to introduce him, I always call him the godfather of auditing. Continuous <laughs> auditing. Because he is, like, everybody flocks to him for about continuous auditing. We have this big world congress of continuous auditing and research every year. And you're very fortunate to have him as a professor here because he is a visionary. I mean, he saw this occurring in the business industry years before anybody else did. And he stuck to his guns. I mean, even though for many years when people were like poo pooing it, right? Yes, yes. And now it's like everyone's coming to you now for the ideas because they realize now that you know he was right. But you know, it's interesting. Uh, I think Denise is talking about predicting technology. Right. And uh, from '86 to '90, the laboratory leading. Uh, leading research institute at that time, uh, we imagined this and we did it. And we had a, a system that probably still prevails at at and But what we didn't expect at that time, that the internet would look the way it is now. And that the tools, the piggybacking tools were, were in place. And that the methods, the analytic methods could be reperformed a billion times in an hour. And we didn't, and that was doable. So when you kind of think about how you're going to use it in the future, you have to start understanding that there's going to be different technologies in a different environment, and Tom, a different legal environment. Right. That, uh, for example, uh, Denise changed his presentation. I haven't seen all the pieces of the presentation. Yeah. For example, all those restraining things on drones, right. you haven't shown me that. Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's evolving over time, and FAA is yeah. still trying to figure out how this fits in. Yeah. But you know, I was just thinking, Denise shows these inventory taking examples. I had a different idea. Why don't we fly a drone on front, on top of the parking lots? And I see this well, that, on my it's, bench. It's, like, it's also right here in the video. Oh, you have it? Yeah, but it's not a video, but it's a picture. Then. No, no, but I'm thinking about the parking lots of uh, okay. Kmart. Yeah, well, that's what they use. Walmart uses it now. Walmart. You're yes. allowed to fly the drones in their, their actual property. Although they still have a restriction of height of 500 feet, but they don't have to get the permits to, you know, to fly them around. They can monitor their own parking lots, or you know, a lot of times uh, shopping mall owners will use drones in their parking lots also. And, and why would you do that? Because that way you have exogenous, meaning external measurement of the traffic in your website, and you can predict revenue. If you want right. to kind of compare traffic with sales, you can at least get a reasonably good idea what the sales should be at right. that particular moment. And uh, also in your cost of goods sold, inventory that comes in, if you can't measure the RFIDs, you might be able to measure the how many trucks came in. Exactly. On the material. So there are many things. And also you'll be able to measure things that you don't measure before. Uh, but technology will be, will be a little bit different. And we need to think about it. Now what's very interesting is, uh, Denise published this. Well, I don't know where the uh, KPMG found out the, about this. The new paper, yeah, the first paper. In the first yeah. paper. And so now we are finding the firms getting very interested on this. Yeah. If you want to be cynical, you think that they are really in the advisory service, not in audit. Right. But I think it eventually get to audit. We are just a bit old fashioned. Yeah, I think just to clarify, like most uh, auditing firms are. They're, business, they're businesses, so they have the assurance side, which is the side I talked about earlier, which is you know, where we audit, we examine publicly traded companies. 
and they're very restricted. It's very, uh, very controlled by regulations. Okay, and the current the firms are very careful about what they do in the audit. There's a lot of restrictions. Restrictions about actually making profit too, because there are fewer and fewer publicly listed companies now. Companies are delisting, and so they're fighting over fewer clients, and there's a lot of competition. So. There's like financial pressures to keep their fee, audit fees down, but also they're facing this issue where the regulation that really kept up with the uh, current business environment with all the technology and innovations and data um, and the use of analytics by clients. So uh, obviously walking this situation. So they built they built really they're emphasizing more the advisory side, which is where we basically advise businesses about audit matters or accounting matters or any other part of business. So. PwC, they have the, the drone section in Poland, they do, that's more the advisory side. Um, KPMG, when they come to see us on Friday, will be the innovation department, which is their advisory side. Because on the, on the engagement, they're very restricted, they're very conservative. Mm -hmm. So there's, uh, the firms are doing more and more business the advisory side, because that's where the money is. And they could be, they could be creative, that's where they're doing AI, for example, that's why they're that's where KPMG is using IBM Watson. That's where they're experimenting different types of analytics, you know, to see if they can help their clients become more sophisticated. Mm -hmm. So we're expecting, obviously, with these automations, we're gonna have some savings with warehouse inventory, and also with the bridge inspection. We know this from other studies that have been done, completed. So looking at what the drone itself would be like, uh, you know, we have, a, this is a phantom drone here. It's like one of those popular hobbyist drones. It's about $1,500. And it can be outfitted with many different. The uh, one I bought cost 95 Well, there's a lot of different other types of baby drones too. But this is like for professional photographers, people are like doing, using it like for business or semi, uh, almost semi-business type hobbyist. I want, um, I want one of those. I, I do too, Just actually. To play yeah. with it. But I, I don't trust myself, I might crash it. But actually more expensive ones actually are harder to crash because they have more self-piloting and navigational tools. Yeah, you know, Denise was talking about my son-in-law, Jimmy Jim. Jim. Mm -hmm. He's a professional photographer, extreme photographer. So he hangs from ropes and films people with 2,000 feet below him. And sometimes he uses drones. Yeah. And uh, in difficult places, location, actually with Alex Hamo. He is uh, climbing El Capitan, he used drones oh, wow. in some places. But he says that he doesn't put any of his expensive cameras on a, on a drone because he says they'll crash yeah. and you lose your camera. Mm -hmm. So he is very careful with that. Um, also, some places are now, uh, I think Denise mentioned that, are using professional drone pilots. Exactly. The guy sitting down there driving the uh, driving the door. And in the military, they have people sitting in Washington using drones for bombing. Or for yeah, that, and actually, that, they're saying with that particular job, it's like the, these are like Air Force pilots, and they're not trained. They're really like the drone flying with that, but you're sitting in a monitor, and you're observing people for days on end with these fixed-wing drones. Uh, that's more like being a sniper. Because a sniper does the same thing. A sniper will sit there and wait for two or three weeks sometimes, or looking for the perfect shot. So that's what the drone pilot does now in the military. They're actually, and they require counseling a lot of times after a while because they become close to the person they're watching, believe it or not. There's the psychology about behavior, the behavioral studies about this. And they, get, they, they become distressed over the fact they have to kill somebody. Yeah, yeah. but actually there are psychological studies that talk exactly the opposite. I don't really? know if, you, if you've seen this. There are psychological studies that say uh, if you have a sword and have to kill someone, you get a lot of remorse out of it. And this kind of killing a human being, etc. In that, yeah. this case, when you navigate drones or, or you do like carry robots, it becomes like a video game. You, do, you don't have any of these reactions. Yeah. Uh, because, uh, I, I guess, because it's, it's like gaming. You're very used to, to go and, and shoot people in games. So if it's a real person, who cares? Right? There have been psychological studies now basically saying that, that human empathy and human ethics and morale models um, don't apply very well when you are doing the... And this is, I don't know which one is right, but yeah. it's, I think that clearly there is a difference between you sitting in your, uh, in your stand in Washington, D.C., shooting someone in Saudi Arabia or wherever, yeah, you're shooting in Iraq, 
or you having to go there, point to a human being with a rifle or with a sword or whatever you do, and kill kill the person. The more uh, the ethical and etc. etc. And I think uh, drone observation, all the thing, will have things. Yeah, exactly. Psychological say, yeah. Things like that. I mean, because like really, like, what's scary to me, like the idea, and there's a slide we'll see in a few minutes about this. I mean, people, you know. Employees sign, like when you work for a company, you ask to sign off that you agree to have your email monitored using like, their computer, their phone, but might be a call phone be monitored. And there's cameras around, but there's something different about the idea that a drone flying around, you have no idea who's behind that drone, so to speak. You know, and there are stories you hear in there, you know, now about people shooting a drone, they, they feel it's encroaching on their property or looking at them, they can shoot, on, shoot them down even if they don't feel like they're on their property, if they feel like they're being observed. So um, there's something about, the removal of not knowing who's behind that drone, so to speak, is sort of scary. Or, you know, mm -hmm. it's limiting, so to speak. I mean, yes. Can you change the lenses on those cameras? Oh yeah, this is this is like just a typical outfitted lens, a camera a drone. But we can put sensors, you can have audio sensors, infrared sensors. Um, you know, of course they're very flexible, they can go many different places. Mm -hmm. um, they're making me very small, like there's one the size of fingers. And that's very scary. You think about a drone that small can fly around observing you. In fact, I saw one not too long ago. It was like the size of a little hornet. They only fly around for like nine minutes, I think, or a very, very short period of time. So the technology is evolving. Eventually, this might be very commonplace. And that little drone could fly over into a warehouse and see everything. Hmm. So, for example, this is, you know, the idea is you want to plan your, your, cam, your flight in advance. Uh, this is our Walmart, for example. They're using, this is like surveillance, picture taken um, by a drone. And then again, like a drone surveillance in a parking lot where it's the difference in the traffic and activities. Um, this is one by a retail owner. This is one by a, a, a shopping center owner. So they can use this for predicting retail activity and to get an idea uh, based on that as to what kind of uh, main issues they might have with their retail clients. Uh, this is a typical camera here that we've attached on to the drone. Uh, and then these are some of our best-selling camera drones today. Uh, like I said, the Phantom 4 Pro is uh, about $1,500. That's like the most, the most popular one. There's other ones that are also very expensive. This is a, this is a very expensive one here. Um, it's used by many uh, businesses primarily for different very uh, you know, scaling tasks and that type of thing. So, for example, this is a map of a a video reading uh, by the drone of plot of land. And so we could also manipulate objects uh, with drones. Uh, there's always talk about deliveries being done by a drone. This old lady, the granny who doesn't want to <laughs> seeing her UPS delivery guy. You know, that's her boyfriend, right? He brings her, pack, he brings her packages every day, right? Or the drone could also have carry things, like a little dog. Okay? <laughs> I don't think you could carry mochi or not, but. Then you might be able to carry mochi, right? I don't think mochi would be too happy. No, <laughs> the dogs are too happy either, right? You would bite the dog. Yeah. Um, so there's other, we have, uh, somebody was asking about whether there's other objects can go on there. So there's other types of sensors. Uh, we can use infrared sensors, multispectral visual sensors. Uh, there's a thermal sensor looking at wet and dry soil. So for land evaluation, it's very good. They're also being used like for mining, like to, to look at the topography of land, uh, construction. This, and so it's been, there's like a broad use for drones beyond inspections. And then looking at the elevation change, changes in drainage issues. But like, like I said earlier, the big problem now with uh, privacy and surveillance is an up, up and coming issue with drones. So, you know, people are, are aware that perhaps a drone will be flying around. And I, them I, I'm going to put a drone in this classroom. I, I was thinking check, about that. And check who is preparing for exam of another class while <laughs> this class, or playing with the cell phone, correct? I mean, I was thinking about doing my auto class. I mean, I was and I'm going to have Andrea maneuver the drone, yes. correct, yeah. Andrea? Yeah. With camera to prove. Yes. Okay? I mean, I was, I was thinking about and, then Sam is, and then Tom is going to come back and say, this is a violation of privacy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so there's a whole fact, I mean, that based on a CPA journal article that came out earlier this week about, last week about the drones, I was contacted by a, a legal, apparently drones use a lot in the camera industry, and there's a meetup of lawyers out there in Beverly Hills that want me to talk to them like a webinar about drones. I mean, yeah. so. Because there's a lot of applications. Yeah. Uh, 
actually, did you guys get the, the Nises CPA article on the loans? CPA journal? Did I send it to you? This uh, came out last yeah, week. Yeah, I think I did. Yeah, yeah but it was a rough draft for, for about a month. But you know, I just want to make a point here. Remember the parking lot in, uh, that she was showing? You think about that. What's the purpose of a drone there? What would you do? No. This is making them think a little bit. Okay. What would you do with that, with that picture of the parking lot? I would say it was looking at traffic. Looking at yeah. that, actually that's what uh, they are doing. What is Goldman Sachs or whoever is doing? Yeah, that. Goldman Sachs. They, they basically want to predict yeah. on day-to-day -day sales of uh, because day-to-day -day trading is a very big deal, but there is no money, uh, there is no data that right. is day-to-day. -day. I'm going to tell you a little bit about day-to-day -day trading because I have been drilling my son about it. Okay, and he doesn't know either, but speculated together. And uh, so day-to-day -day trading, you would know the volumes and we can't predict the sale for key location. And you know, like uh, Hume's technology, right. you cluster stores together and they behave the same way. So do analytics help. But hey, but think about this, what else you could do? You could take a picture of the license plates. Right. And you could look at the brands of the cars. So if you just look at the brand of the cars, you have a proxy for wealth. Right. of the population. If you look at the license plate, you might be able to find out who that person is, link it to the credit card, predict if they made a sale. So you can go very, very intrusive with this. Thing. Right. And yeah. I'm sure you guys could think an application on top of application that would do much more than that. that like see if the people walking in are fat or skinny. Right. That's bad. Isn't it? <laughs> they have hair or no hair. <laughs> and if they have hair, do they buy more hair products? No, I'm just kind of joking here. Right. But, uh, there is a lot of things that we start thinking about what you can do. I always, when I talk about parking lot, I talk about face recognition, list of employees, list, list of clients. Uh, like a client walks in, his rack is already waiting for him. Right. Uh, or you already pulled out what products he might buy. Uh, or you have a list of bad guys and you already call the police or something like that. So a lot of things you can do with this. Very invasive, correct? It is. Yeah. A company like Goldman do this, that way they have a leg up on their competition. They can, it's all the day to day trading or day trading is very, it's by millisecond. So the advantage is that you have information that other, your competitors, other firms don't have. So Goldman probably does buy data from different data collectors. Yeah. You know. uh, Kevin, you had a question? No, I was going to add to the things that you could actually do to uh, also look at the amount of time people spend in the store. Exactly. As a way to see like how much customers are attracting mm -hmm. compared to like the competitors. Right. You have somebody who goes there for five, like two, three minutes, versus somebody who's still there like half an hour. Exactly. By the way, I didn't invent the drones checking if you're doing home, homework for the class. Uh, actually, some of the large classes in Stanford, or I don't remember which one of the Ivy League schools actually have them. In the large class auditorium, for to avoid people cheating, they have drones fly. I think Professor Kalman, the chair of the department, is also doing that because Typically, I was still sitting in the back of the room, and I know my concern is, like, particularly the larger classes, it's hard to monitor the back of the class, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Professor Applebaum actually is teaching, together with Professor Palmer, your last uh, accounting research, research class. Yeah. Right? It's a three-credit class. Right? Last class. It's a three-credit three three class, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Science, uh, accounting, research. And we had to show you a research proposal like every week. Like. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah, she teaches already. auditing yeah. undergraduate. <laughs> yeah. No, like when I went to the bathroom, I saw one of your students. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we'll see if I come back next year, right? Yeah, <laughs> you should. Come yeah. On. So anyway, uh, to follow up on, is it Tom, is your name? Okay, so you might be interested in this. Like there was a case of recently in California court about some employees who got upset because of the drone flew around and saw, actually in this case, this is an example here of their loitering around. So it would be like place. some students poor right. behavior monitored. And this, okay, they were playing with their cell phones and preparing yeah. for the classes. So I mean, the, the drone, this company monitor, you know, conducts, uses the software to monitor, the drones to monitor the, the sites and the construction sites and 
they monitor these employees like carrying on and playing around during company time. And the question is, okay, so this is a private firm, right? The, the employees sign and agree that they're going to be under the, the company's control or company's domain, right? So the question is, do they have the right to fly around and take pictures? What's you know? the answer, Tom? Is within the firm? Yes, right? Yeah. Like they yeah. can examine yeah. their desk. It's, they can it's, listen to your telephone calls. Yeah, it's a private entity that's performing the search. Right. Then the, like, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to that. So it would have to be whether you have a reasonable expectation of privacy. They clearly don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in the work. So they most likely have, you, know, you would probably be able to take pictures of them. Yeah. Especially also, some states have, uh, you know, if you could video somebody without telling them, right. the same way you could record a phone call without telling the other person on the other end. In New Jersey, it's that way. They, they can record you and not tell you. Yeah, it's one party state versus yes. two party state. So yeah. things like that, you don't necessarily have to tell them. That I think California is also a one party state, at least for recording. Like the guy from the uh, the owner of the Clippers that got right. recorded by his girlfriend. Oh, yeah. That, uh, it's a one party state, so she was within her legal right oh, to wow. record him. The you president of Brazil was recorded by someone that was bribing him. <laughs> the new one, right? Yeah, the, the interim president who is now in big trouble. Okay, we had to hurry up. Okay, so uh, this is a, as an example of, you know, there's a big issue, of course, with surveillance rights, privacy rights. We have to be aware of that. This area is still being, you know, basically trying to be developed by the FAA in terms of regulations. So there's other issues with drones also. I love that. Uh, this is uh, drones have to watch out for the chubby Siberian tigers. <laughs> 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 they look like mochi. Yeah. They're getting hungry, though. I don't think I would like to be close to them. No. See, there's a bird flying around, they're chasing the bird. Now, there's a different kind of bird coming around. They're still very hungry. Oh my God. <laughs> they knocked down the poor drone. <laughs> and he was so disappointed not to eat. I know. <laughs> Much <of that>. <laughs> <laughs> But it's winter time, so they, they put that on and probably the furs blow them too. Oh, so this is showing like the, what the drone captured before was chewed up. Okay, that you know, it was playing around with the, the tigers and they, this is what it'd be like to be ch chased by a pack of tigers. You know, I wouldn't want to be in this situation, but And that guy could really jump high. When yeah, I know. See they're looking at him it's like <laughs> 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 no, those are nice shots. Yeah, I know. It's spectacular shots. Yeah, so, yes. so that's like, you know, that's, there, are, there are dangers to the drone too as well, obviously. So this is, you know, the, the big collection of pictures and videos taken by the drone. So that was another uh, area of humor here. So that, uh, basically we developed a automation process for the drone application and auditing and accounting using our drivers of value development implementation and management processes. We also developed it for warehouse taking, you know, warehouse um, drone architecture prototype. And we suggest that someone, you know, if they're interested, that you take that as a sandbox approach. You do the small section of the warehouse, a small observation of assets. Don't try to bite off more than you can chew it right off the bat. So if you start with manageable to find objective, um, big issue like indoor or outdoor use, uh, how are you going to map where you're going, Data ownership, like who's going to hold control of the data once it's collected. As auditors, we want to make sure we have control of the data. And you have to keep the drone inside at all times, okay? So that's another FAA regulation. So uh, we can fly it around the warehouse, but we have to be able to see the drone. Um, you will crash, okay? So uh, but, you know, obviously you have to have skills to learn uh, how to fly a drone. Um, there are the basics of multi-rotor flight, safety practices, operating checklist, those type of activities. Um, this is the kind of drone that I have that packs on a very small one, it's like $50. Uh, this is one that's, or this one's $80. So these are different types of features you want to look for. Um, I could provide this list for you later if you're interested. Um, basically, we see the profession right now, we're here, and the, uh, everything's very manual, but our, our audit clients are very sophisticated. 
And we want to eventually get to a process of automation using robots, drones, and software bots, where everything is very manual and routine is very automated. So the auditor or accountant can basically look at those transactions or issues that require sophisticated analysis or human judgment. So uh, we, we see the drone innovation, but you know, we're looking at drones, we're looking at robots, we're looking at the accountant over there, we're looking at also the robot here. A combination of different types of automation, um, and it's all pulled together with a cloud-based data center. Yes? Do we, right now, do we have enough bandwidth capacity to operationalize drones and, and for drones to continue to up upload the data to the cloud? Like let's say it's AWS Azure. Um, I would say, depending, I mean, it's hard to say without you know, how widespread their use will be. Um, I haven't heard that data is restricted, I mean, if there's a limit on how much storage we can, uh, data there could be. Um, I mean, look at the internet with like how much Facebook uh, stores every day or how much, they, how much data they collect every day and Google also. I mean, Tesla, for example, they have 65,000 cars. They basically have thousands of sensors on them and they're collecting data all the time. Mm -hmm. And that hasn't been an issue. So it really depends on infrastructure developed by the firms or the companies that are collecting the data, the cloud providers. They, you call it the ecosystem of the, of the product, correct? Yeah. The ecosystem. The ecosystem, you, you right. You need to develop a way to collect the data, to store it, right. to sense it, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think that drones, I can't sell a lot of problems for automated accountants, but that I think that it can address some issues that were still very manual until, until now, and which may have hindered the process of becoming more automated altogether. So when we put drones in the equation along with analytics and software automation and other processes, it could be maybe from now we can actually look at more and more companies using continuous auditing or actually using automated analysis of, of transactions. So we see that the, there should be a value of drone uses perhaps in the audit uh, in transaction process. Uh, but we have to establish the value of, and, and the research to make sure there is a gain to be had. Um, and, this, and also we're in the, in the environment now where technology is evolving, evolving rapidly. More and more jobs in accounting and auditing and finance are becoming automated. And the, basically anything that's very routine or manually or very, you know, can be repeated very easily is being automated. So accounting is no exception, auditing is no exception, and so routine inspection processes, uh, routine valuation processes could also be also uh, automated. So we're hoping that this, the, 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 the automated process will allow us to have better insights because it's a machine collecting information and not a human being. And therefore we can use that data to collect it and, and, and actually do things that are more interesting. So self-driving car is a good example. The self-driving car started with, okay, I'll hurry up here. So that's an example of where over time it can evolve from a very manually controlled process to when it becomes very automated. So it can be a self-flying automated drone. <laughs> and we have, like, for example, in Dubai, we have 30% of the police force in Dubai are, are robots that walk around the streets and can read, the like, facial recognition, can read who the people are, give you a ticket, you can pay the, the guy, the, the, the cop his ticket here on the screen here right away. Um, and so this is being experimented or, or being conducted in Dubai. Like I said, a third of their police force is now going to be these traffic cops. And if they, if they encounter a situation they can handle, they bring in a real cop. And we also have already in Israel, there's automated dr drones that fly uh, automatically without any kind of human intervention or any kind of piloting. So technology is not the future on its own. The future is about ways in which auditors can leverage technology to uh, perform their tasks more efficiently and effectively, and deliver better value to the marketplace. And those of us who, and you, are, and you are these auditors and accounts we're talking about being in this class and coming into the profession now, you're going to be better prepared for this evolution than current auditors and accounts most likely, and therefore you have a better chance of surviving this upheaval in the profession. So have fun and fly a drone. And this is a story real quickly we were talking earlier about progression of technology. Uh, this is based on a, a, a slide or a PowerPoint from that Israeli firm. It, it, I thought it was really good because it sort of reviews like the progression of technology and how it's very slow at the very beginning and really took off during the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, we've progressed from man on the moon to automated drones, automated cars in 30 years. You know, so it, it basically it's a very quick evolution 
Um, and we're, we're right, right here on the top of it, so it's all going straight upwards. And we're going to see more and more automation as time goes on. So um, I thank you very much for your time today. I'm sure sharing my research and my with you. Uh, drones be automated flying auditor bots, right? So I appreciate your time and if you have any questions or you're interested more in doing this kind of research, feel free to talk to me, okay? Yes. So One question because we need to go to the, the next group can set up. The group that's going to present the governance group, who is it? Just go and set up while they're answering the question. So um, my question is like, now like you're working as like an instructor, so how does the process work for you to have like a full-time tenure track position at another university? <laughs> oh no no, this is not. No, 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 this no. is this is the, this, you can discuss with the needs after we yeah. about that. We have, we haven't lost the needs. The needs is okay. still visiting here for the for the well, PA and program, and we are going to be talking about that. I just, uh, the questions here have to be on. Any question about Any drones? Questions about drones or automation or accounting? We talked enough. Uh, we talked for now. Um, I, I just want you to think. Uh, go ahead, Tom. I was wondering about what about injury caused by drones? Sorry? What, if, what about injury caused by drones? Injury caused? Caused by drones. Like, what if someone loses control but they take either damages uh, inventory or it hurts a person that's working in the factory? Well, yeah, there's, um, you know, they, the rules of the FAA suggest that they, drones should not fly over people. And that's why drones aren't allowed to do for inspection over the road when there's traffic on it. Because it's concerns that the drone could crash and cause, you know, car damage or kill somebody or, you know, so even with the parking lot, they'd be careful not to go fly over active activity. Even though it's their personal property, because there isn't liability there. Yeah, and what about, you know, companies taking into consideration now practice insurance? Yeah, well, that's, that's part of it too. Because now you have all these people operating machines that they're learning how to use. Something like I think this is a whole set of considerations. Yeah. What it stuck to me with Denise Shaw, I haven't seen this before, is altitude limitations. And this is probably because the rules before protecting airplanes were that high, so they have it there. But human benefit is not to be measured that way. So maybe at the end, Drones are more useful than many commercial planes. Yeah. And we need to restrict commercial planes, not drones. I, I, I don't think society knows that. And this is part of that question that we're talking about, how this is going to be regulated, and how do you get rid of the old rules in favor of the better things for society today or in the future? I think that's a very important question. I, I think Denise, Denise has been working with us on these auditor type of things. Audit is anachronistic. The rules are the rules of the last century. Okay? Are, yeah. And uh, the old rules make the new rules impossible. Mm -hmm. And so there, there has to be. Denise, thank you very well, much. Thank you. Enjoy thank you. Thank you. is not boring. No, but some professors are, but... <laughs> oh, you got thought much for a second. You need that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you know, the other thing is, once people start using drones, people are using drones already. Okay, I had a friend who was in two Schloss, and he was using airplane photography to measure cattle in ranches in Colorado and Arizona. And the problem he had is identify if that was a cow or a bull, because the picture was from the top. I'm sure now they can do that. But there'll be secondary, tertiary type of users mixing applications, some in auditing, some somewhere else. And this is a thing. And I have an assignment for you for next time. One page telling me something you imagine that drones can do in the audit. Can we repeat you something that that Denise done, but with your touch on it? Okay? And it doesn't have to be exactly audit, it can be accounting. Anything in the financial area is good. 
I want you to think about it. That's why I'm giving you this. And send it to me, uh, send it to me and to Andre. Parker is actually made a movie, and, and they filmed part of the movie using the drone, so they flew past all these malls. Who did that? Parker. Rodgers did the film. Yeah, yeah. using drones. That's what my son-in-law does. Yeah. Okay, guys. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is John Turner. Peter Foley. And uh, we are presenting about IT governance and public. Um, so this is a basic definition of IT governance. So IT governance involves managing IT operations, IT projects, and share alignment between uh, these activities uh, and the needs of the organization defined within the strategic plan. That may, might be hard to understand. Uh, so a simpler definition I made is that IT governance includes the processes that ensure the effective and efficient use of IT uh, in embedding an organization to achieve its goals. So how IT helps the organization achieve its goals. Um, all right, so uh, basically how is IT governance audited? Um, and IT governance is audited through the evaluation of strategic and operational alignment of IT uh, organization using enterprise business strategies. Um, and in using these strategies, uh, the IT uh, must support the goals of the organization. Um, and IT governance um, must to measure the IT uh, delivery performance uh, and report the results to the uh, executive and higher uh, upper management. Um, and then the results of the continuous audit um, uh, help represent how well uh, the organization is functioning and um, the key metrics uh, that the management needs to see to uh, improve the value and benefit the organization um, based on the IT. Uh, and then um, the results are applied and monitored uh, through um, throughout the organization uh, with the appropriate government governance and uh, accountability. Um, so this is just a diagram uh, showing that some of the roles uh, within IT governance um, and the frameworks, which Allison is going to cover a little later, um, and uh, Peter is going to cover that a little later. Sorry, um, but uh, basically understanding uh, the the value and the cost of IT is important um, for the board and the senior uh, IT management, and um, the successful alignment between the organization and IT uh, occurs when goals, uh, objectives of the organization are aligned with the needs of the organization. Um, and then, so these are the five focus areas of IT governance. Um, I'm not gonna read them off, you could read them. Uh, but in the next uh, slide, you can see the different um, uh, focus areas and how they relate um, with the different bodies of the organization. Uh, and in so in these different focus areas, um, there are a bunch of questions that usually get asked uh, to help uh, specify and identify um, where changes can take place. Um, so uh, for the organization and government's um, structures, uh, I'm gonna read off some of the quick basic questions for these, and one of them is, uh, is there a CIO uh, in place, and is he or she a member of a senior management team? Um, and then for executive leadership, um, are there structures of the organization uh, and its operational components clearly organized uh, such that the IT functions can effectively uh, help enable achievement uh, of the organization's objectives and goals? Um, so focusing on how that IT structure can help fulfill um, the goals of the organization. Uh, and for strategic planning, it's um, what decision bodies uh, are in place to enable alignment of organization um, with the services, the IT services that uh, will create adequate and adequate environment um, and accountability for the uh, firm and for a delivery service. Uh, and or our organizational needs and IT service requirements defined in strategic uh, ta tactical plans and are they monitored and do a CIO and senior management uh, meet and discuss progress on plans on a regular basis. That's for the delivery service. And then for IT organization and risk management, um, basically seeing if, uh, or asking if uh, roles and responsibilities are clearly defined and communicated 
and our organizational leaders empowered and held accountable uh, for the results um, that are shown through the IT governance. Uh, so, why is IT governance important to us um, as future accountants? Um, so, if you do end up uh, working for especially larger firms, um, I know KTMG does have uh, a division of internal auditing, uh, which may cover things like IT governance, um, and also just the increased importance of technology in business, um, especially uh, with the sensitive data that's being handled, helping mitigate that risk. Um, it's very important to keep our information technology systems organized. Uh, and uh, it is a growing opportunity for auditors, as I said. Um, you know, KPMG is probably the biggest firm I know has um, internal auditing that will cover IT governance. Um, and as technology just you know further permeates uh, daily our daily lives, it'll become more and more important. Uh, so for IT governance, uh, there is a number of frameworks available. Um, these are just a sampling of a few. Um, IDL, ITIL, um, is one of the oldest ones. It's been around uh, since actually the mid '80s, believe it or not. Uh, it was started by the uh, CCTA in the United Kingdom, and uh, it used to stand for Information Technology Infrastructure Library. Um, it has since dropped that and is now just known exclusively as IDL. Um, it was also bought out by a company, um, Axelos, uh, yeah, Axelos uh, in 2013, uh, so it's no longer publicly available, um, but companies can license it uh, for their own usage. Uh, COBIT was developed by ISACA, um, so COBIT uh, is another one that used to be an acronym, no longer an acronym, um, but it's the... Uh, COVID is Control Objectives for Information and Related Technologies, and ISACA, um, for those who are not familiar with it, um, is the Information Systems Audit and Control Association. Uh, COBIT was started, I believe the first iteration was around 1996. Um, they're on COBIT 5 now. Um, what's great about COBIT is it actually will go through and they'll update their standards as other frameworks are updated as well. Um, so like one of those is the ISO IEC standards. Um, that's not necessarily an organized framework, um, but the ISO is an International Organization of Standardizations, and IEC is uh, the International Electrotechnical Commission. Uh, so uh, the ISO and the IEC uh, together, they've got a joint commission that will go through and produce these standards uh, that can be followed. Uh, so IDLE, uh, some basics about IDLE. It's divided into five volumes. Uh, it actually used to be over 30. They decided to reduce it for uh, you know, ease of use. Um, so service strategy is going through and identifying what your organizational um, objectives and customer needs are. And then you take that and you use your service design um, to actually turn that strategy into a plan to deliver um, your business objectives. Um, then your, your third step, the transition, um, is the actual implementation of that plan, um, putting that into place. Uh, service operation is managing your new services and making sure um, that they're functional in their supported environment. Uh, and then continual service improvement um, is making sure that the services uh, go through their uh, incremental achievements and their large scale improvements. Uh, so again, that's just a really basic run through of IDLE um, because it is five volumes long. Uh, but we'll go on to the next one, COVID. Um, so COVID is again <laughs> also divided into five, although uh, the COVID manual is significantly shorter than IDLE. Uh, so um, COVID starts off with meeting your stakeholder needs. Uh, so that involves identifying every stakeholder in your company. Um, so that's anyone that will interact with you. Uh, and then identifying what needs they have and making sure that those goals are met through your information technology. Uh, so covering the enterprise end to end is taking those goals and objectives that you established when you were you know, going through step one and actually making sure that each person uh, in your company uh, who needs to be accountable for these knows. Um, they use what they call RACI models, um, which is uh, reporting, uh, accountability, uh, consulting, and informed. Uh, so 
those are the people um, basically just assigning levels of responsibility onto each of those tasks. Uh, step three, applying a single integrated framework is really COBIT's way of telling you to use COBIT uh, because COBIT, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uses the ISO IEC standards and applies those to your organization. Um, so if you use COBIT, you have your single integrated framework, uh, you should use uh, you know, whichever framework best suits uh, the potential <coughs> of your client. Uh, enabling the holistic approach is where you're actually supposed to go through and identify the enablers within your company um, and make sure that they're interacting correctly for your information systems to work. And then separating governance from management um, is important and especially notable uh, for anybody who might be auditing IT governance. Uh, COVID defines uh, governance uh, as those that ensure the needs, conditions, and options are evaluated to determine the balance and direction. Uh, and management plans, builds, runs, and monitors those activities um, to ensure that the alignment set by governance is followed. Uh, so last, I'll just briefly touch on the ISO IEC standards. Um, so theirs are numbered and they don't have fancy titles. Uh, so 20,000 uh, is basically uh, mostly just about your system requirements, uh, certifications for your IT auditors, and your application and cloud services. And the 27,000 series uh, covers more technical items such as uh, system management, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, frameworks for systems management, uh, techniques to use for managing your systems, and the actual practice of it all. So now I'll also talk about the IT certification. Let about. me just make a comment to start, Alison. Uh, we then a survey uh, of nine leading internal audit departments, and the one thing that one of the things that struck us most is that they are not saying anymore we need someone to be a CPA. They always say they need someone to be a CPA or equivalent. What's the equivalent? Or, huh? What's the equivalent? Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. He's a little slow today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to talk about first the CISA, CISM, and CGETI, or EIT, sorry. Um, all these are Um, all these are certified by the ISACAs, which is the Information Systems Audit and Control Association. Um, so the CISA is the like most common one, I guess. It's the globally recognized cornerstone certification for information systems, audit, control, assurance, and security professionals who control, monitor, and assess an organization's information technology and business systems. Um, this is considered the current industry standard for IT auditors. Um, in order to get certified, you must complete five years work experience in information systems, auditing, or control or security work experience. Um, and now for the CISM, which stands for Certified Information Security Manager. Um, that's also certified by the ISACAs, um, and it's a certification program for those who manage, design, oversee, or assess in an enterprise's information security. Once again, you need five years work experience to obtain the certificate, and um, it's done, designed for information security managers. Um, the CGEIT is the certified, um, the certified in governance um, of enterprise IT, which again is an ISACA certificate um, developed for professionals who have a significant management, advisory, or assurance role relating to governance of IT. Typically, job um, typical job roles that receive the certificate include senior um, security analysts and chief information security officers. Um, and now for the CISSP, which is a Certified Information System Security Professional. This is certified by the ISC squared, which stands for information. Oh, International Information System Security Certificate and <laughs> Consortium. Um, also, like I said, ISC squared, which provides security training for information assets. Um, once again, for this certificate, you need five years work experience. 
and it is designed for security managers and consultants. So these are not all the certifications you can get, these are just the ones that I picked out that I thought were most important. Um, yeah, and the reason why you want to get these certificates are it um, confirms your knowledge and experience, qualifies market and ex um, uh, expertise, and it's an increase in impact. Are there any certificates that doesn't require more experience? No, I'm pretty sure all of them do. Okay. I'm pretty sure. I mean, I didn't read about every single one because there was like a lot. But yeah, most of them require a lot of work experience. Uh -huh. And so not necessarily like in accounting, it's like in IT, like computer science backgrounds too. Mm -hmm. So what do you guys think what do you guys think is going to happen with this? What is the future in this? Do you think it's going to be more and more certificates showing up that you can take? And why? started Caesar, they actually offered me to grandfather me, and I was a bit of this older, older <laughs> at that time. Um, and you know, for me a certificate, like I passed a CPA exam, I never bothered to get the exam, because what does it do? Uh, I never bothered to get the certificate. I took the exam because my wife was taking the exam. And so, and so it didn't help me very much. But um, the problem is that you are a company and you're going to hire someone. These are very technical functions. You have no idea of the content of that, of that function. You are not technical. So the only thing you can do is, is go on certificates, on credentials. And these organizations create these credentials. They, there is a credential out of the AICPA that is a technical. Uh, credential, and so you know, people say they don't even know all the credentials. Actually, I didn't know one of them. Okay, and and so they, they need the certificates as a way to validation. Uh, and I think your point is about of uh, of uh, knowledge obsolescence very fast. It is really true. It's very very true, and uh, I think there is a real need of revamping thinking about uh, what certification means. The CPA certificate uh, is a way to validate that people know something, but is also a way to create a monopoly and to increase the fares of the people that get the certificate. And these things have to be the same thing. Okay, it's basically to limit entry. Now, some, uh, some young man young woman that comes in into Silicon Valley and learns about networking or learns about cloud and et cetera, et cetera, they have a narrow domain of competences that probably is better than CISA or something like that. So uh, I, it's, uh, the other thing is a very wide thing, certification in IT. It's, it's a very specialized type of thing. Uh, I'm happy that you, you brought this in, the group brought this in. Because can you just guys tell me for a minute what is governance? They, she had a very good comment there about governance and management. You want to repeat, Alison, what you said about governance and management? <laughs> I don't remember what I said. Um, where, when was that? <laughs> she, was separate, she was separating management from governance. Correct? And you talk a lot about corporate governance, what does that mean? Is that uh, the people that are in charge of being representatives of the stakeholders 
are not people that are running the company because of the agency thing that we talked before. Okay? So governance is a wide set of rules to keep people honest. And management is basically running the company. And so governance is used to make sure that the running of the company is good. And if you have corrupt management, it's very difficult to govern. And so this whole, and IT governance is basically the same kind of st thing. It's things to see if your rules of IT and IT controls and etc. are taking care of management doing the kind of things you should be doing. I'll give you an example of, of governance in, uh, in business enterprises. You have a board of directors. Board of directors are representative of your stockholders. There you have audit committee. You have a compensation committee. What is the idea? The idea is that they have a compensation committee to avoid that management overpays themselves. So what does uh, what does management do? They hire external consultants to set what an equivalent salary for someone in that, uh, in that type of function is. And very seldom they will pay themselves much more than that. And the way they do, the stockholders start screaming because those disclosures are needed. But before there was the requirement of disclosure of salaries of top management, uh, this was rampant of overcompensation and because compensation committees were being paid by management, compensation committees were not, not independent. So the governance was deficient. The same kind of thing here. Uh, governance of the IT function makes very sure that the rules of the game are adequate for IT controls and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, just bringing back again what Alison was talking about, um, it is very important to create certifications because at least that's a way to verify that the people that are working have some degree of competence. Now, uh, the other thing about, uh, about COVID and et cetera, et cetera, uh, those are, if, if you try to implement COVID guidance, which is a whole set of volumes one after the other. It's very loose. It's just kind of very generic rules because it's very difficult to create very, very narrow rules uh, to that type of thing. So this is very, very soft type of, of domain. And then the next thing is uh, what I was used to talk about IT audit. When I started teaching IT audit, um, I was, I said, eh, in five years, everyone is going to be an IT audit. Why? This was in the 70s. Um, why? Because every company, basically all their data, all their numbers are processed by computers. So what's the purpose of an auditor not being an IT audit? Correct? Accessing the data and using the data. Even today, only 15% of the auditors are IT audit. Can anyone adventure why? Actually, I, 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 Denise, what do you think? What do the 85% that are not computer auditors do? Uh, Andrea, Andrea. <laughs> Andrea yeah. was a non computer auditor. Yeah. <laughs> you test controls and you take and time. It depends on the, the experience you have. So uh, the non-IT non auditor is they use data, but they depend on a tertiary source to create the data. And they certainly don't understand the IT governance that created the data for you. And so I always felt that uh, I don't understand how this developed this way. Okay, now I think I understand, I understand at least I have a better theory. My theory is that uh, the tools for IT auditors were very, very specialized. And it's very difficult to pick up an entire class like this without spending a lot of time on it and teach you guys. You know, the needs when you teach auditing, you teach idea, correct? Yeah, in fact, it's a bigger component of the class. It was a quarter of the grade, 25% now. 
You are going to teach them? Uh, yeah, yeah. And they are going to be very tough with them? Yeah. Oh, good. In fact, the students like that. I mean, they, they also learn tableau in my class also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's what started to happen. Uh, they are teaching tableau in, in the audit classes, and they are teaching uh, either ACL or IDEA. They are two, like, they are a little bit spread, spreadsheet like, can't they? Excuse me? Uh, ACL and ID a little bit well, spatial. Well, it's based on Excel macros, and there's like a lot of portability between Excel and IDEA. So it's more familiar uh, interface, whereas ACL is more like um, SAP type. It's not, it's, a, it's a proprietary language. But these tools yeah. are a little bit complicated to use. And the firms, you know, many firms will train everyone that comes in, either in ACL or IDEA, is that correct? Well, it's not that they're complicated, but the Firms have real idiosyncrasies about how they handle the data. And I was surprised that when we went to run our project for the study at KPMG University, almost everybody's laptop is configured to protect the data. And it was very difficult to get the experiments to run correctly because everyone had different configurations. So I think that's a big problem is like trying to get it to the point where they feel comfortable with standards and protect the data to run the program. But, but my, the question I was asking is why, why has been so few auditors became more entangled or more involved in technology? My guess is that because they're, they don't feel comfortable with it, for one thing, and it's not something that they can actually control, like, you know, it's like a big black box. And so they, they have trouble, or they, they don't understand how to test the controls for it. So I think, I think your answer is, my, is what I am starting to believe. Right. I'm starting to believe that the tools are too complicated. Uh, yeah, and so I'm now very big into drag and drop applications. Like June talks about it, is uh, the ASCPA uh, created the audit data standard. We, we have been working on this for five, six years, and now there are this whole set of guidance how data should look for being audited. Now, if you can create a homogeneous platform that can use any of the apps that are being developed, and by the way, two of the big four are, are vendors of apps at this moment. Uh, I, ha I just have been pushing June to write an article for the CPA journal that, because that was her part of her dissertation, she did it. She looked at what they did, and basically everyone knows how to drag and drop. Do you know how to drag and drop? Yes, you know how to drag and drop. Do you, Wendy? Yeah, but yes. <laughs> you know, I still have, to, I mean, somebody's going to have to validate the process behind it, the underlying software behind it. And, and that's where the IT is. And there is a government co right. governance right. component, meaning right. if the data center doesn't have integrity <laughs> governance, uh, anyone could just put some data in there or extract the data any way they want. Exactly. Uh, and, and so the governance component is very linked to the technical, comp technical part components and the quality of the data that you get. And also it's much easier to talk about lofty things like governance and etc. than actually doing that analysis. Isn't that correct? Andrea, what do you think? <laughs> so I think Don't agree with me. Auditors and accountants question everything. So that's, I think it's another and the mindset. They're afraid of losing their mindset to some degree. Yeah, you have to be suspicious. Right. Yeah. Uh, actually, I, uh, I mentioned to you I was in the Isaac panel two weeks ago here, and it was uh, it was something like skepticism in the age of artificial intelligence, and it was basically saying. How do you remain skeptical, and how do you question the thing? And the next thing, if, if you are skeptical, how do you apply tests if you don't have technological competence? So actually, I, I don't know, my, my most recent set of theories around this is that the reason why these things have gone very slowly is because the tools are very difficult to use, even the specialized tools. Not difficult for the need, or for you if you are well trained. But in general, people don't have those skills. Any other theories that you can share with us? Well, I mean, are you talking about the insurance side or the advisory side? Oh, no, the not advisory. Advisory, right. advisory is a whole different story. Yeah. I think that the regulations have a lot to do with it also. 
Oh, so we are blaming on the regulation? Yes, my favorite, my favorite topic. <laughs> what do you think, Tom? Probably, probably. Probably, probably, the problem, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was talking about, uh, about where we need change regulation. I'm going to send you my regulation slides uh, today, okay? And you can have a look at it, then we'll talk about it next class. Um, thank you very much. I think it's too late for me to start something that... Uh, 20 minutes left. 20 minutes? No, it finishes 5.20, we have... It finishes 5.30. You guys want to go home? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> we'll, we'll go home and talk about starting something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I might abuse your time a little bit, but I can see everyone that's with me. Thank you. Thank you. Send the video of uh, people printing out.